Pwede po tayo. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So we now resume with our uh, much anticipated open forum or the Q&A for this uh, uh, paper, the segment of the paper presentations. Again, uh, may we remind our audience to please uh, type in your questions and comments in our chat box. So at this point, may I request our paper presenters to turn on their respective cameras for the question and answer. Okay, so good afternoon, uh, Brother Kendrick, uh, Professor Austria, and uh, Father Earl Valdez. So the first question is uh, for father or for brother Kendrick Ivan Pangaliban. So this is this has something to do with uh, the singular face of the Black Nazarene. So the question is: If these Nazarene shrines were constructed using the Jesus Nazareno of Quiapo as its template in order to replicate the singular face of the suffering Christ. Have you observed the following details? If the following details are the same. Number one, the degree of the darkness of the skin of the image. Number two, the expression of the face of the Black Nazarene. And thirdly, the degree of angle in the face of the Black Nazarene as it looks heavenward or upward. Okay. So, Brother Kendrick. Um, first of all, good afternoon to all of the participants here in this conference. Um, when it comes to discussing about shrines, um, let us first remember that we are not necessarily pertaining to the image itself, but to the church. The shrine is not the image. The image is the face of the shrine, but the shrine is the church itself, the community of that church and the church itself. So, for example, if we're going to go into the particulars of the image itself, um, I cannot uh, say that there are, well, kung kamukang kamuka or very, very much identical. But let us remember that of the four of the five shrines mentioned, including Kiapo, so remove that and there are only four left. Uh, three of those shrines had uh, their images, um, they got those images from Kiapo because those were replica images that were brought there from one of the different uh, visits of the pilgrim image to that place. Then because of the attachment of the faithful to that image, so uh, the journey of uh, acquiring the image, of getting the image and having it donated to the diocese of that certain place uh, became possible. So um, as to yung iconography, um, I am not really, I cannot really say if there is, uh, if those specific details were followed. However, what could I, what I could say is that regardless of the angle of the uh, certain degree of the skin or etc., what is important in uh, seeing the, the shrine is that it is well it is it allows it, it becomes a welcoming place for the pilgrims of the Nazareno in that certain region or in that certain diocese. Okay, thank you for that clarification. 
So there is another question also addressed to you, Brother Kendrick. Yes. The question is, uh, can shrines be uprooted from its sacred ground if historical landmarks were bought and erected piece by piece, part by part? Um, well, like, for example, in uh, uh, Akusar, no? in Bataan. So, architect Akusar in Bataan um, actually uprooted some of the heritage houses for the sake of uh, preservation. So, do you see the possibility of shrines re erection? So, that's the question. Um, before we tackle about uprooting shrines, let us first remember that uh, shrines are declared shrines because of the bishop and because of the diocese. So there is a canonical requirement. And uh, because of this, so for example, what are the canonical requirements? Of course, first is that the place should be uh, a property of the diocese, the place itself, the church itself. That is why yung mga lugar na tinatawag na shrine pero it's private property, those are really not shrines. What we call shrines are those churches that were declared by the bishop of that place or by the uh, Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines as shrines. Okay, so that's the first point. The second point is that if we're saying we're going to uproot the shrine, and move it to another place, that needs the canonical approval of the bishop of that place. For example, um, there is a certain case, for example, in Bataan, the original shrine of St. John Paul II of Bataan is in uh, Morong Bataan. So because of uh, certain uh, problems, I think, with the, with the neighboring areas, so it was moved to another place in another town in Hermosa, Bataan. So in order for the transfer to occur, so there was supposed to be a communication of the bishop to the people of that place and moving it to another place. So there was a canonical process. It same goes to sa question po na yon that uh, the shrine first, the shrine that's supposed to be uprooted is one that is canonically declared. So one. And the second thing is that if it is a canonical declared shrine and it will be uprooted and sent to another place, there should be a feasible study on how it is possible and that there is a communication and correspondence with the bishop of that diocese. So um, this is really um, something uh, that we have to take note of. Huh? So um, it's not really an easy process to be uprooting huh? mm -hmm. uh, shrines. Okay, so our thank you, uh, Brother Kendrick. Our sec our second uh, presenter, Assistant Professor Alain Austria. The next question is for you, Professor Austria. Are you yes. Okay, so are you there? Okay, so yes. the question is, uh, which do you think comes first in the case of the photography of Raymond Gapi? Is it Raymond Gapi as a devotee, as the devotee, or is it Raymond Gapi as the artist? So to simply put it, is his it is his photography, or is his photography rather an art or a devotion? Okay, I guess the devotion came in first. Um, of course, we don't have enough time to actually discuss this uh, in the few minutes that were given for all the panelists. No? But on the paper that I wrote, um, there is a lengthy discussion on how the devotion started. And this devotion started when they were still a boy. So uh, prior to the commitment itself to photography as the devotion, I think he is already a devotee from the very beginning. And then, you know, uh, the devotion itself, that of being the Nazareno, came first. So whether you like it or not, he learned photography in the Middle East without any training, without any um, workshop. So, and then he utilized what he learned from that hobby. Every time he goes to Manila 
over to the Philippines because at that time he's working in Saudi Arabia and his vacation is always on time from December to January so that he could join the translation. So in this case, we have one person who is a devotee first before he became a photographer and became good at it and eventually managed to make it an official part of his devotion. At first, it's just being plain because it's hard to be, uh, according to his uh, to my interview with him, one of the difficulties at first is how do you perform two roles? You are a devotee of the Nazareno and at the, at the same time, you are somebody interested in photography. Um, he found a solution in having uh, their own chapter. Eventually in 2014, he became an Eos del Nazareno and he find uh, an interesting solution there. So if it, if his chapter, he's from Antigong Mamamasan, is assigned already for a particular part of the translation, then he is on a Mamamasan mode. No cameras because it will be virtually impossible for you to do that. But once they go beyond the responsibility, for example, from this part of Rizal Park up to this part, this is under this particular chapter, no? Pagtapos na yun, then kuha ang camera ulit and then sunod. Okay? So basically, he's dividing his time no? um, uh, between being a photographer and being a uh, uh, participant in the translation. So I'm just speaking of the translation his relationship with the translation. But when he became part of the SOCOM, I think uh, it's at that moment he became practically full-time in terms of um, uh, shooting uh, events that has something to do with the Nazareno. So I'm, uh, it's pretty obvious that the devotion came in first and then the interest in photography and then the realization that photography can be a good way of you know recording this for posterity and considering the artist in him he realized that his photography is not just for record purposes because people are responding in faith people are responding with devotion people people are responding with the profundity of readings that they themselves that the photographer himself is surprised that they devotees can actually read his photography in a deeper way than he expected. So I think it came in progression like that. So I hope I answered that question. Yes, thank you. So this is more of uh, an observation or a comment, uh, still from uh, Raymond Gatti's work. Um, so here, uh, the one who asked uh, said, Raymond Gapi's work is truly visually delightful. It is as if he was in some kind of divine inspiration when capturing those, Im those images. He seems to be always in the right place at the right time. And uh, the question now is, how could this be possible? What do you think, uh, <laughs> Professor Austria? Well, I'm into oh, photography too. That, uh, uh, Raymond Yapi uh, was able to capture um, those uh, very, uh, very uh, important uh, scenes from uh, the translation. Okay. So, so say, uh, first. The How idea. Possible? Um, I don't know. Um, I think we have to call him. Okay, I don't know if he's in the house. Okay, but uh, you know, architect Gapi has was. Uh, I had the chance to cover and take photos with him because I, uh, uh, I myself took a workshop at the Ala Museum on photography, and our assignment is the, uh, the Black Nazarene procession. So I had the privilege of, uh, being with him. Um, and the idea is that there's nothing, when you are there, there's nothing that would say that there is something special, he's always in the right place at the wrong right time. You know, what we are seeing in the presentation is, actual, is actually a just a very minuscule portion of his body of works. His body of works, of course, how do you deal with more than a thousand, uh, thousands of files? Of course, not all of them are perfect stuff okay some of them are wacky stuff etc etc but um it is something that he alone could answer what is it in him 
what is it in his uh, spirituality that somehow uh, we call it in Jungian psychology as synchronicity. Okay, he seems to be always on the right place at the right time without even trying. Okay, uh, a good example of that, uh, if you saw that particular picture of um, uh, the, um, how do you call this, the, um, the snipers atop Kirino Grandstand, those people who were responding to a real terrorist threat. In fact, they knew that there are some two to three people, uh, suspicious people who are with the crowd in 2015. And that's the reason why the snipers are aimed at them. You know, he never expected it to be like that. So when he took the picture, he's just talking to those individuals and lo and behold, it's a diagonal frame. No? And it created a lot of comments and um, uh, responses in, in the internet. Another one would be the case of um, you, that boy, that young man who's praying the rosary, the all the while pala, nag-aayos lang siya ng rosary, pero ang ganda ng post niya, no? Um, again, uh, I cannot answer it. Why is he always in the right place at the right time? I think it's always a question among people who are phot practicing photography. There are times where in, it is intentional. You were there. You, in, you knew that something would happen. But in most cases, the most popular photos or your most greatest, your good photos are not really the ones that you never really tried to make beautiful. They are, it just happens, okay? So I think more than anything else, it's synchronicity. Is there any fate involved in it that he was able to take classical photos of that? It's between him and the Nazareno, and I'm not privy to that relationship, although I can get a glimpse, but I think he prefers not to talk much about it. So there is, there must be divine intervention. Yes, um, but, yes, okay. That's why uh, he was able to capture exactly you know, what uh, maybe the Nazareno would like to say. Yes, to yes, capture. definitely. Okay, so we were talking backstage earlier, and we said that the pictures of uh, Raymond Gapi actually tell a story. No? So there is always a narrative mm -mm. behind every picture. Mm -mm. Okay, so there must be something, there must be a message that uh, these pictures would want to impart no? mm -mm. to all our devotees of the Nazareno. Yes. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Brother Kendrick and uh, Professor Austria. Okay, so uh, sadly, we cannot uh, ask the questions intended for uh, Father Earl Valdez since uh, um, he has to, to go to his uh, class because he's having a class right now. So we will just forward the questions to Father Earl to after the conference. So there is another question for both our presenters. Oh, yes, there is a question addressed to Brother Kendrick. Yes. So is there a historical process before, before the declaration of a shrine? So is there something to that effect? Is there a process we follow? before I, a church to be declared as a shrine? Uh, yes, of course, there is a process and that process involves applying that certain church to become a shrine. So uh, that begins with the petition of the community. Uh, the shrine cannot be declared without the, without the consent of the community of that place that uh, it be declared a shrine. So for example, if a certain parish will apply to become a shrine. So first they have to uh, have a certain document that produces their consent. So for example, a res resolution, a parish uh, resolution. Then after that, the petition is sent to the bishop and that bishop would uh, have his team, for example, the commission on liturgy or the commission on shrines, examine said document. And from there, if the said uh, document is approved and uh, the church is deemed worthy by the diocese to become a shrine, then it will be declared as a shrine. Now, 
uh, what is important in have is in declaring a shrine the decree there should be a decree and it should be uh, issued in the shrine and during what we call solemn declaration or the liturgical activity wherein the shrine is to be declared a shrine uh, the people should see that the decree is being uh, held up high and uh, seen by the people why because it is the document that proves that your church is eligible or canonically allowable to provide indulgence. Kaya po, declare po ang mga shrine kasi they need uh, the documentation for them to be able to grant indulgence. So once that is established, that there is a cult of devotion and that there are also a fulfillment in the other aspects, as I have already said, there are seven aspects of shrines in the new evangelization, not only devotion. Devotion is just one of seven aspects. That's why um, siguro para po mas madiscuss pa po natin, ito nang mas mabuti, I think uh, uh, you could uh, buy po my book so that uh, you, may be able to, you may be able to see yung uh, other po na discussion po regarding po the aspects of shrine food much okay so if there are no more questions so perhaps we could now proceed to the awarding of certificate to our paper presenters okay, so the certificate reads the minor basilica of the black nazarene Quiapo, manila awards the certificate of recognition to brother kendrick ivan d pangaliban for delivering this paper at the first National Research Forum on the Black Nazarene in the theme 500 Years of Journey with the Black Nazarene Devotion in the Sports, held on March 16, 17, 2022, by a Zoom virtual video conferencing, signed by our lead convener, uh, Reverend Father Fernando Coronel. Rector and parish priest of Chiapo Church. Thank you. Okay, congratulations, Brother Kedrick. So, also, we would like to award the same certificate of appreciation to Professor Jose Ale J. Austria for delivering his paper at the first National Research Forum on the Black Nazarene with the theme 500 years of journey with the Black Nazarene devotion and sports held on March 16, 17, 2020 by Zoom virtual video conferencing, again signed by our uh, lead presenter, Reverend Monsignor Fernando Coronel, PhD. So let's very much. take a round of applause. Thank you so much. So we now turn Turn you over to the next set of uh, paper presentation. <clears throat> the difficulties and challenges of the devotion to the Black Nazarene. Is the Black Nazarene an adequate enough, enough image of one Jesus of Nazareth? Or is he simply a projection of what we want Jesus to be? For one, he's black. It reflects our uh, brown color as a, as a race. He is on one knee. He is a... Uh, 
All right, uh, good afternoon. So we welcome back, sorry, for our little engagement on technical issue, but actually we're just covering uh, a few more other presenters for the afternoon. Paper presentations continuing with our presentations for this afternoon. So we shall have first, It's very interesting before we proceed now, while we are working on the next uh, video presentations. Um, it is very interesting that we cover multi-dimensional aspects, not only covering religion per se, but we will also be covering this afternoon some or some other aspects that will tackle even in depth. We have one more research here about um we and one more we'll based on the main Lino Broca, I'm sure, certainly ring bell to everybody's ears. So, for our next presentation, all right, we shall have first Mr. Morgan Wilson's presentation. The title of the next research presenter is. For the loss of power, place, and performance of popular devotion to the Black Nazarene. Our paper presenter is an undergraduate student of Southeast Asian Studies School at Nava Salo University. He is currently working on his thesis, which is centered on the devotion to the Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno of Yapo. Our next paper presenter, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Balian Jordan. Hello and good day to everyone. Um, I'm John Valiant Jordan, an undergraduate student of the La Salle University, and I will be presenting my main undergraduate thesis also an analysis on the power, place, and performance of popular devotion to the Black Nazarene. So a brief introduction. So this is a research grounded on my personal experience as a devotee of the Black Nazarene. So from my experience as a devotee, um, this is a multi-generational devotion passed from my ancestors until it was taught and formally introduced in my age of reason, where I was started to be brought to the Church of Quiapo, attended processions, and all the other traditions that her family does in honor of the Black Nazarene. And because I have witnessed some of these traditions and how people celebrate and perform their devotion to the Black Nazarene. It led me to have this ambiguous concept of power in the devotion because I have witnessed all of its practices, its performances. So we already know, um, um, most of us, I believe, that the image was brought by the Augustine and Recollect Fathers in the beginning of the 17th century. So this is a life-size image of Jesus Christ of fair color that is carrying the cross. And is made of dark wood, carved by a Mexican carver that was brought to the Philippines. But colloquially, to us, even now, it is known as the Nazareno. But formally, it is, it is known as the Tres Caidas, or the Three Falls, which owes to the biblical accounts of the three falls that Christ had on his way to Calvary. 
So my hypothesis for this research is that if the devotees have this clear knowledge of their devotion, one would note the distinction between the official practice of popular devotion and its nuanced forms. Statement of the problem for this research is threefold. How do devotees perceive the concept of power in their practice and performance of popular devotion to the Black Nazarene? Second, what are the developments in the devotion that happened with regards in their perception of power to their performance and expression of devotion? Lastly, in what ways does this affect their religious attitude and disposition as a devotee? For the objectives, um, it, uh, first, we wish to further expand the discourses on the idea of power and potency in Southeast Asian studies highlighting the lived experience of Filipino Catholic devotees. Second is to contribute to the existing studies in the devotion to the Black Nazarene of Quiapo. And lastly, to result into creating a diagram mapping the dimensions, levels, and places of power in the Church of Quiapo and in the practice of the popular devotion to the Black Nazarene, not only here in Quiapo, but in other parts of the Philippines and of the world, where there is a present devotion to the Black Nazarene. First, before we delve into the study of the Black Nazarene and its popular devotion here in the Philippines, we must um, discuss first the context of religion here in Southeast Asia. So we have here a picture of the Emerald Buddha. I place it here um, since in Thailand somehow it kind of counterparts the, it mirrors the devotion that we Filipinos have here in the Philippines in terms of its extent and perceived notion of power. So the Southeast Asian region provides a home to most of the world religions. And in Southeast Asian society, there are two realities. So first is the religiosity of the people. How religious are we? How religion plays a part in our lives? And poverty present and experience. So, with no doubt, religion is a very integral part of, of our society's culture, which changes through the course of time through new developments and interpretations. Philippinization of this foreign faith, the Catholic faith, underwent first in a process of what we call syncretism where folk practices and an indigenous set of beliefs blended very well with the Catholic faith when it was introduced to us. So folklore has formed a major part of our narratives, religious beliefs, lives, and worldview of our society, who traces its indigenous nature to a certain place which in turn expresses our cultural identity. So part of these beliefs is the use of objects as manifestations of the divine or God, to which they direct their expression of faith. In fact, in our nation's history, the image of the Santo Niño de Cebu was used by natives as an, as an agent for their prayers and supplications, such as when drought occurs, the image is bathed in the sea for rain. This practice has syncretized with the, litur with the liturgy, of the celebrations in Cebu and in private devotions as well. So this proves that indeed objects, in this case images, are essential in the practice of the faith of the people. The concept of power according to Anderson in Southeast Asia has already been present in the polities in the region. However, it differs largely from its western notion. According to, he, to his comparison and from his studies in Java, the Western tradition or what, how the West perceives power is that it is something abstract. The sources of it are heterogeneous or comes from multiple sources, military power, political power, economical power. The accumulation of power has no inherent limits. It's limitless. And lastly, it is morally ambiguous. There may be questions of legitimacy, 
on how moral it can be. However, in the Javanese tradition here in Southeast Asia, when Anderson studied, studied Java, power came as something concrete. Power is also homogeneous or comes from a single source. In this case, it is something from the divine. The quantum of power in the universe is always constant. It, it is always constant. It's ne it, it never diminishes. It never exceeds. Lastly, power does not raise the question of legitimacy because power is. Power is. So the Southeast Asian concept of power also centers on the concept of space and periphery, like this image that you see on your right, an image of a mandala. Geertz also offers us that an intimate aspect of the relationship between nature of power and the persona is also very essential. And Walters, on the other hand, adds another aspect of this concept of power in, in the definition of soul stuff among the commerce of Cambodia that roughly translate to the possession of power. However, as Father Mercado will put it, the Filipino concept of power differs in ways that it uses objects and symbols as agency. Popular devotion may be defined as collective prayers and rituals done by the people with no official recognition or liturgical origin. It may come from political and historical events, private revelations and visions, people doing their own rituals out of popular devotion because of clericalization of the liturgy, charismatic leaders and leaders of crusadas or crusades, cold liturgy, and lastly, divine inspiration by the Holy Spirit and the people of God. So this religious experience of the people in their devotion forges an interpersonal relationship with Jesus Christ. And this may be seen through how people define Jesus Christ through the context of their own experiences, such as wonder worker and provider, as what Wilfredis Jacob has inferred in his series of interviews with the devotees of the Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazaret. So a twofold explanation as to why people are drawn to practice popular devotion is because of their religious experience, kanilang mga karanasan sa kanilang pagdedebosyon kay Kristo, and a pull by the sense of the divine. So a theoretical and conceptual framework for this study focuses on religion in Southeast Asia highlighting the concept of power of Benedict Anderson and its application and understanding in the context of Catholicism in the Philippines by Father Leonardo Mercado and other Filipino clerical scholars. With this diagram, I wish to convey the dynamics of the flow of power in Quiapo that aims to discover the essentiality of proximity of objects to the source of power, in this case, the original image of the Nazareno as discussed by Clifford Geertz in, and Reynaldo Ileto in their respective studies. At the same time, in this diagram, we could see the reciprocal path of prayer and power that flows to the possession of the people through the use of objects, either sacramentals or non-sacramentals, and their performance of popular devotion. The relationship between these three concepts object, people, and piety as a way to map and locate power in the practice of the people's popular devotion to the Black Nazarene, at the same time highlight that these three elements are essential in the practice of the devotion to the Black Nazarene in Quiapo, and each of these elements are interrelated with, with each other. Furthermore, this study will draw from the same frameworks in discovering and understanding the nature of power and its relationship with the concept of place and space and their performance of popular devotion surrounding the Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno of Quiapo.
The methodology of this research is being conducted in a philosophical and phenomenological approach, drawing inspiration from the phenomenological study of Carpi and Reyes of De La Salles Marinas on the devotion to the miraculous San Agustin of Tanza Cavite, where they diagram the Caracol of Tata Osteng and all of its elements, such as the image, the andas, the people, the letters, and even the clothes of the image into levels of meaning and symbolize it according to what the community has assigned it into. Second, online research, virtual interviews, observations through videos of the annual translation procession and incidences of local Palangay processions and regular Friday devo devotional masses will be done, taking into consideration due to the limits imposed by the government because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Lastly, participants are devotees who have, at the very least, been a devotee of the Nazarene for three years. The rationale behind as to why devotees of not less than three years are to be chosen is because we have assumed that they have this grasp and understanding of their personal devotion to the Black Nazarene the devotion of the community of the devotees, and how is it expressed, and the meanings behind it are understood. In the beginning of this presentation, I have mentioned that this is still an ongoing research in preparation for my final defense, and through the series of interviews that I have already conducted, I have found some, find some preliminary findings on how the concept of power is perceived in the devotion to the Black Nazarene. First, the devotion redefines the meaning of power in Southeast Asia, where not only power is concrete, homogenous, constant, and does not raise the question of legitimacy, but rather it is now shared among all and challenges the concept that power is concrete, which I will be explaining in a while. Second, the importance of fostering relationship with other devotees for or pakikipagkapwa in the elements of knowing the power of the Nazareno. We do not see a linear direction from God the priest, and the people on how the flow of power is being directed, but rather we see it now among all devotees being shared from one another. Lastly, collective prayer, strength in numbers as a result of samasamang pamimintuho, manifests a redirected perception of power. With relationships between devotees coming into a new light, especially the, de the role of the devotees in the concept of power in the devotion to the Black Nazarene, they become now agents of power and enablers of potency, or BISA. As I have mentioned moments ago, that the devotion challenges the concept of power, especially that power is concrete. It is because how devotees perceive it goes beyond what is tangible. Though we have objects such as images, handkerchiefs wiped to the image, rosaries, novena booklets that aid the snar prayer, the multitude and collective performance of our devotion is sufficient enough. As agents of this power, we become possessors of biaya or grace in the form of symbols and objects. Our performative actions towards our kapwa of awa, linga, kagandahan ng loob, and pagbibigay handog are manifestations of this power. An example would be the practice of the patanao or dungao of the replicas of the Black Nazarene during the time when the Church of Quiapo was closed to the public due to the Omicron surge. Devotees who possess images of the Black Nazarene brought it out of their homes for others to perform their panata. They now become agents of power and enablers of potency or visa. An initial conclusion of mine is that the, that the Nazarena devotion 
not only fits Anderson's definition, but also adds or challenges it. Second, it is a unique devotion that manifests deeply of our Filipino philosophy, especially of the loob, the essence of the kalooban, and a reflection of how it behaves like the ancient mandalas of early Southeast Asian history. And lastly, this devotion is a case of a game changer on how can we fully understand our culture and, uh, and our identity as a people and how we can understand the Southeast Asian region. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. So we come now to our next paper presenter. So our next paper presenter is Dr. Michael Demetrius H. Assis. So he's a former theology department chair and professor. Demetrius H. Assis. Just of the devotion to the Black Nazarene. Is the Black Nazarene an adequate enough, enough image of one Jesus of Nazareth? Or is he simply a projection of what we want Jesus to be as Filipinos? Wherefore, one is black, which reflects our uh, brown color as a, as a race. He is on one knee. He is uh, genuflecting. <clears throat> so he is kneeling on one knee. Does that suggest our uh, more or less submissive, or subservient nature as Filipinos in the face of crisis, suffering, whether man-made or catastrophic <clears throat> or nature? And yet, like the Filipino, the Black Nazarene is looking upward Okay, appearing hopeful. So we Filipinos, no, in the face of crisis, we don't lose, we don't seem to lose our balance. We don't seem to lose our humor. <clears throat> and finally, we robe him with royalty because that's how we treat our kings, our champions, our heroes. Okay, we enrobe them with royalty, no? like uh, the Black Nazarene who is uh, in his uh, velvet uh, attire <clears throat> or wardrobe. Well, the devotion to the Black Nazarene reinforces the popular Filipino Catholic belief that suffering and sacrifice may promise healing and deliverance. For many of us, this is a concrete and meaningful way of encountering Jesus in their lives. No? That's what popular piety is, no? to make the presence of God more accessible to us. That's why we, that's why we have devotions to, to, to the saints. No? to the mother of Jesus, to all sorts of saints, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and that the, and the, and the figures 
figure, fig, the, the representations, concrete representations of these uh, of these uh, men and women are are uh, they <coughs> they appear on our in our home altars in any Philippine household. You can see all all sorts of saints and so on and so forth. But the question is: Is the Christ of faith adorned? Adorn the Black Nazarene consistent with the historic life and message of Jesus of Nazareth? Or is it the risen Christ who is really, really the real Jesus because he is still existentially encountered today as the risen Lord? <clears throat> but of course, no, the risen Christ, if you remember, showed his wounds as proof of his life, proof of his humanity. <clears throat> so the challenge today I want to <clears throat> pose is how we can link the Christ of faith to the historical Jesus over and against a Christ who simply appears to be human. So the, the one you see on the cross only appears to be Jesus. He is not really Jesus because he's one divine person. He cannot be human. He, can, he only appears to be human suffering on the cross. Of course, that is a heresy. That is docetism, no? Uh, and that heresy was condemned, I think, in the First Council of Nicaea in 325. <clears throat> but doesn't the Black Nation precisely humanize the Christ of faith uh, by focusing on, on his suffering? But on the other hand, is the excessive focus on suffering the focus of the historical Jesus, as we can perceive in the devotion to the Nazareno? <clears throat> On the other hand, did Christ not focus on the kingdom of God in his mission? And suffering is only the price we pay for realizing that mission. He didn't go around, go about the towns of God, is he preaching that we suffer? Okay, well, it's good to suffer. Huh? Okay, suffering is an end in itself. No, he said, if you want to realize the kingdom of God and follow me, Okay, take up your cross. Okay, so the cross is not an end in itself. It is a way to achieve an ideal that is the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so he says in Matthew 5.10 in the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So this quest for the, for the historical Jesus expresses this priority of Christ and the kingdom over the church and even its revered sacred traditions. So the historic the Jesus who in fact existed in history and became the risen Lord is always over above the church. The church is only a servant of Christ and its kingdom. <clears throat> So is the Black Nazarene then an honest appropriation of the historical Jesus? Now, uh, don't get me wrong. I am not separating the historical Christ from, from, from the Christ of faith. They are one in the same. Okay? The historical Jesus became the risen Christ and the risen Christ was in his life the historical Jesus. Now, according to Alfred Nolan in his work, uh, Jesus Before Christianity, he says, Christ's divinity is not some mystical aspect of his life, but the very depths and fullness of his humanity. Nobody, no other person on earth could ever be so fully compassionate, so fully loving, so fully sure of himself, so fully and profoundly in touch with the truth and with God. He is unprecedented in every way. Okay, Of all the prophets spoke to us, kings and wise, all sorts of wise men, but now in our present time, Jesus speaks on behalf of God. He is the word of God. <clears throat> now, when you look at the creed, Jesus is born of Mary. He suffered, died, and was buried. Mm. The Filipino Christ is very much like that. He does not ever grow into manhood. Once he's born, we have the Santo Nino, we celebrate him during Christmas and Christmas, and then he dies. We have Santo Entierro, Black Nazarene, and then you have Holy Week. 
of course, and the January procession for the Black Nazarene. Nothing much is said or celebrated about what went in between. Nothing about his public ministry of teaching, preaching, and healing. I think there must be a, a Holy Week devoted only to the public ministry of Jesus. Well, good that we have the luminous uh, rosary by Pope, initiated by Pope John Paul II, no? the book that speaks about the, the proclamation of the kingdom of God, the miracle of Cana, institution of the Eucharist, transfiguration, and so on and so forth. And given our history of suffering as a people, certainly, obviously, we readily identify with the suffering Jesus, the Black Nazarene. So we have flagellations, kissing the feet of the entombed Jesus, engaging in frenzied mass processions, so during Holy Week and January. Now, what is encouraged is quite suffering in the face of persecution and terrible suffering. And there is too much uh, ex the expression of sentiments and emotions on the suffering of death and Jesus. Reflections on the right wound and then on the left wound, on the right wound and the uh, right foot and the wound on the left foot. And, and the, you know, there is just sentiment and listen focus on the suffering and death of Jesus. And what do we encourage in this devotion? Well, what are encouraged are what we call virtues associated with fortitude, <clears throat> pagtitiis, pagtitimpi, pakikiramay, that reflect, for example, our kundiman songs. No? Kundiman songs are songs about wounded love. No? The lover abandons himself to the will of God or to fate or destiny okay, to win the hand of, the fair, of, her, of his fair lady, even at the cost of suffering. Okay? That's why they are called songs of wounded love. <clears throat> Now, question, did the early church perhaps downplay the defiant radical message of Jesus to avoid persecution from the civil authorities? So, of course, Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John were, were writing within the context of their times. And within the context of their times, they were probably occupied by, by, by foreign, uh, foreign uh, nations, most likely Rome. So, so as not to antagonize them, no? they, they somehow... Uh, um, uh, softened the radical message of Jesus. Because according to one uh, scholar, he was a zealot like any other zealot. But what sets him apart is the fact that uh, he, he did not espouse violence. Most of these messianic figures in the past espoused violence and they ended up in crucifixion. They ended in crucifixion, in their crucifixion. But Jesus also ended in crucifixion, but he preached not violence, but love and tolerance of enemy. Now the challenge is how we can transform these uh, Filipino virtues into virtues of the Beatitudes. Remember, the Beatitudes are no passive tolerance of evil and justice, but a display of courageous self-restraint. Self think of Gandhi. Think of... Uh, Luther King, who fought for, for civil rights of the Negroes in the 60s, but did not spouse violence like Mahatma Gandhi you know, in his quest to <clears throat> win independence for India. So can Pagtitiis, Pagtitimpi be transformed into virtues of the Beatitude? Okay. To mourn, to hunger and thirst for the sake of righteousness. So it's not simply a passive passive virtue of fortitude, okay, but but the passive virtue of fortitude takes place because of an active cause or campaign right? against injustice and and tyranny, for, for example. Those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, what I what I think we need are what we call mediating structures, okay? that translate the gospel into specific social action and strategies. Now, these mediating structures are faith-based groups that provide what is lacking precisely in our devotees. Okay? That is, namely, a social commitment or at least a social consciousness and awareness of the wider social ills in society. So most of these devotees are too much centered on their suffering. 
but are not made aware or are not more conscious of the wider social ills that come in the form of systemic evils in society. So what we need are like BECs or lay organizations and movements, political parties, and civic, civic society groups like NAMFREL that, that are faith-based groups that translate the gospel into concrete political social action. Be, you know, to renew the church, you need, a, you need BECs to organize the parishes into streets where there are street leaders and every and all the street leaders are represented by herd a servant a head servant leader so if you if if don't so we so church life must not focus on the parish building or the parish church where the where where where, where the parish priest simply sits and you know and presides over mass and collects all that money he has to go out into the streets like like pope francis said and have the smell of the sheep and walk with other people, walk with the people like just, these, just as Jesus did when he walked in Emmaus with the two disciples. So the way to renew the church is to have these faith-based organizations and communities like the BECs. With the BECs, people know, know each other. They celebrate uh, mass in the streets and so on. So, so, so the church becomes really the people. It's not the parish convent. But of course, still we'd rather identify not with Jesus, the liberator from oppression, but with Christ, the victim of oppression. Certainly that makes our experience of suffering personally meaningful when we identify with the black Nazarene as the victim of oppression. But it disregards, as I said, the wider systemic evils that cause so much suffering in the world. But of course, if you are familiar with Reynaldo Ileto's classic Passion Revolution, at least, he demonstrated that a particular reading of the Passion could inspire collective action to achieve deliverance from injustice and oppression. He was talking about lowland uh, small organizations, most of them cults, who saw in the Passion an inspiration for fighting for justice. So the price you have to pay is the, the price that Jesus paid himself, suffering. And the moral, mental, psychological fortitude to to withstand the instinct to retaliate. <clears throat> so, according to these uh, 18th, uh, uh, early 19th century movements, at least they saw in the Bashan an inspiration not to be passive, not to passively accept suffering, but to actively, okay, uh, actively uh, eradicate suffering by fighting for, for freedom. <clears throat> But will the resurrection ever make sense to the Filipino, no, the kaginawaan that Ileto is describing? Even the risen Christ in the Salubong appears only to console his sorrowful mother. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> what I am proposing here is Jesus, a Jesus image that could inspire a more solid, a more social consciousness a more social consciousness. The Bayani is one who gives his or her life completely for the life of the nation. And his heroic self-giving inspires Bayanian, the collective effort for the person or persons in need, the nation in need. Of course, we have the iconic image of the Bayanian, diba? men, several men carrying a nipahat of the neighbor, okay, because they are, I think they is moving somewhere else, so moving to next, so they're carrying the, so that's Bayanian. So that's the iconic image of, of the collective effort to help the neighbor. But could Bayanian today be represented by people who carry not, not a nipahat, but the, but the corpses of teenagers killed in the war on drugs? Or men and women, uh, carrying placards uh, de denouncing injustice and unjust taxation laws and so, so on and so forth. So in other words, could this collective effort mean therefore a more intentional, heroic uh, approach, okay, to fighting injustice in society today and all the social ills, okay? Could that, could by any hand mean that today? You know, of course, we we treat as kings, no? Our mythical figures, FPJ Arab, or even Ramon Rebilla, uh, Nardung Putik, and so on. 
because they are perceived to fight our fight. They take the the our, the cudgels up for in our fight against injustice and tyranny in the world. They take the fight to our oppressors. Okay. Now, can we see the black Nazarene precisely as such? Our own champion, our own hero. That's why we enthrone him as king. Okay. Is he therefore the suffering servant of God? Or is he precisely a suffering servant because he is a victim of injustice? Is he the Lamb of God who takes away our sins by dying for our sins? Or the Lamb of God who dies because of our sins? At least the sins of the people during his time. The sins of pettiness, envy, corruption, hypocrisy, greed, ambition, unbridled ambition, and so on and so forth. Jesus then is every man, if he is one with us, if he is Emmanuel one with us, he is every man unjustly accused, unjustly judged, unjustly incarcerated, unjustly executed. And by suffering in our place, he saves us hopefully to inspire a heroic discipleship that looks out for those in most need. So the May elections is upcoming. What can we do heroically okay, to promote the causes of truth, justice, integrity and so on and so forth okay so needless to say we have to choose wisely <clears throat> and because the nazareno, nazareno takes up our fight he is our champion he is our hero you know and there you know when you look at today you look you look around you look all around when you look all around us today okay we see empty churches worldwide. No? We, we look all around us, there are empty, empty churches worldwide and they are very much like empty tombs and sepulchers. And like the first women disciples, we have to find the reason, Lord, not in the empty tomb, but elsewhere. He has gone somewhere and we don't look for the living among the dead. So these empty monuments, these empty tombs and sepulchers, Okay, once known as church, our churches, shrines, and cathedrals, then plead for a new way of being church. The writing is on the wall. God is speaking now. If the churches are empty, what is he saying? He is saying that we have to find the risen, crucified Lord somewhere else. He has gone somewhere else. Where? In a world. In the world that is full of misery. And therefore, according to Pope Francis, we must, as a church, function like a field hospital. The way Jesus operated his public ministry, he didn't stay in the synagogue or the temple. He went about all the towns of Galilee and Israel and made his ministry function like a field hospital, as Pope Francis coined the word that looks after the defenseless, the sick, the hungry, and the dying. So what then led the black Nazarene to his faith? Bakit siya sunog? Bakit siya sinunog? Bakit siya itim? Bakit siya pilit na pinaluhod? At bakit siya pilit na pinagkarga ng napakabigad na krus? What led the black Nazarene to his faith? This is a question I think we must ask ourselves again and again and again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Demetrius Asis. So we now call in our second or our third uh, paper presenter. So he's a faculty researcher of uh, the Research Institute of Human and Social Development and Associate Professor Five, Department of Sociology and Anthropology 
from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. He received his master's degree in theology from the Loyola School of Theology and his doctorate degree in sociology from the Ateneo Manila University. He is the author of a three Scopus Index books published by Springer Nature, Singapore. He has published several peer-reviewed articles in top Scopus and Web of Science Index journals, such as Religions, Open Theology, Leinacher, Quarterly, and Cogent Social Sciences, to name a few. Presenting his paper titled, Gender, Catholic, Social Teaching, and COVID-19 in the Philippines, analyzing the social solidarities of women devotees in two Black Nazarene Facebook groups. Friends, let's all welcome Dr. Vivencio O. Maliano. Thank you very much, Dean Raul Sebastian, for the holistic uh, understanding of the article. Now I will discuss to you the overview of the research, the theory, methodology, the results, and discussion, as well as the conclusion. So, first of all, um, this study aims to know whether the members of two Facebook groups of the Black Nazarene have social solidarity to the poor beyond their family members. It is assumed that women are socialized in that traditional gender role therefore they focus their concern on the family members especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now this study aims to argue otherwise that these devotees have strong social concern beyond the family but the question is whether this social solidarity of the devotees conform with the church social doctrines called uh, Catholic social teaching. So, so we, we want to understand whether the, so their social concern reflects the Catholic Church teaching and then we'll give you some recommendations after the presentation of the results. Okay. So we have the methodology. The methodology is actually a textual analysis, discourse analysis of 150 uh, Facebook posts and prayers of the two groups of Black Nazarene devotion. Okay, so we were, we were analyzing them and then we we classified them into teams and we want to understand the their concept of social solidarity. Most of the members come from the urban poor and then most of them are mothers. Okay, so let's go to the to the results. So it has been said that women are socialize a traditional gender role. Therefore, they are caregivers, basically house housekeepers. And so their concern is more on the family. But here in our studies, uh, it was found out that out of the 150 uh, posts that we analyzed, only around 30% focus on the family concerns, no? for their children, for the husband, etc. Okay, so let's go to some example of their prayers so like this Til Tilma for instance prayed for the health of her youngest child uh, during the COVID-19 no? to be tested negative so also there's another prayer on uh, Petra praying for the recovery of the husband you know we, we discovered that uh, there are prayers focus on, focusing on the husband in the traditional gender role the husband is the breadwinner so if the husband gets positive or infected with COVID-19 uh, then the family lacks social support because in the traditional gender role the wife is the housekeeper and is not earning income outside the family so that's the traditional gender role so you'll notice that there are post focusing on the husband for healing during the COVID-19 pandemic then uh, Aside from the family, we also discovered that there is strong sol solidarity for people outside the family, like the medical frontliners, the prayers for the doctors and nurses. There are also prayers for the, for the country. So, the, so surprisingly, 
they they are praying for the country outside the family, no? family concerns. And then finally, they are also praying for global solidarity or in order that the entire world will be free from COVID-19 pandemic. No? That the Lord, uh, the Black Nazarene will save them from the global pandemic. Okay? So, so these are some samples like Lola. Dear Lord, you are the refuge in the entire world. Please, please help us in our prayers. No? To, to end the pandemic is spreading throughout the world. Okay? And also Rita and the rest. Okay, let's go to the analysis. Uh, so we have analysis and discussion for the Catholic social teaching. Uh, social concern, social solidarity is part of the Christian faith. And it is a virtue, not just a temporary feeling for compassion for, for others. But what, what we discover in our study is that their social solidarity is more of disaster solidarity. Uh, we call it in Filipino also as bayanihan, kamaradiri. So it is a uh, concern for, for brothers and sisters outside the family who share the same traumatic experience. So that's what we call disaster solidarity. But that is not what the Catholic social teachings about social solidarity but because it is more of a virtue for the church teaching, virtue, part of the faith. But here, the type of solidarity we discover is more on human concern for those who are suffering from the same uh, uh, disaster experience. Okay, so, so what is our conclusion? So our conclusion that uh, despite traditional gender role, Women, the mothers, the, the deputies have more concern beyond the family. Two thirds or more sixty percent, more than sixty percent focus on their concern for the for the frontliners, for people who are victims of the COVID nineteen, for the entire country suffering from the pandemic, as well as the entire world. So this debunks the idea that Filipino women, especially deputies of the Black Nazarene, lack social concern beyond the family okay and it also sh it also showed that the the findings sh showed that their concern is more on uh, disaster solidarity rather than the official teaching of the church on social concern now the problem here is yeah. because of the lack of catechism the catholic social teaching their their view of social solidarity uh, is not really uh, in accordance with the church teaching but more or less there is sharing there because we believe there is a legal pluralism in society different social normative systems interact with one another therefore the catholic social teaching has no monopoly on the teaching of social solidarity these catholics these members of the the facebook groups also learn it from other sources other normative systems but there is also common uh, common element there of loving one's neighbor beyond the family okay so what is what are our recommendation the, we recommend for further studies to explore this type of social solidarity of the members of the black nazarene beyond the pandemic okay and then we also recommend that the catholic church you no know, uh, should provide more catechism to enhance the social solidarity of members of the black nazarene and then to explore uh, more about gender equality in the, uh, the oldest uh, devotion in the country. Okay, so thank you very much and we thank you also for our Dean Raul Sebastian of the Polytechnic University and for the committee uh, allowing us to present our study. Dr. Malano and Dr. Sebastian. Okay, so moving on to our fourth paper presenter. So our next presenter is a Filipino Jesuit priest. And before he was ordained to the priesthood, he was the executive director of Simbahang Lingkod ng Bayan, a social political arm of the Philippine Jesuits in March 2011. He volunteered as a first responder to Tokyo, Japan to help with the stress debriefing of overseas Filipino workers who were affected by uh, the March 11, 2011 earthquake and tsunami. His first assignment as a priest 
was to do parish work in Kabanglasan, Bukidnon from 2012 to 2018. So during that time, he attended an international workshop initiated by the Jesuit Conference of Asia Pacific entitled Reconciliation with Creation on June 6 to 10, 2016 in Malay Balay City. So during his stint as the Province Indigenous Peoples Ministry Coordinator, he was sent to Yogyakarta, Indonesia to attend the Sustainability of Life Workshop initiated also by the JCAP in 2016. He was convener of the Indigenous Peoples Summit on July 11 to 12, 2016 at the Ateneo de Davao University. In 2017 of July, he participated in the Asian Youth Academy Asian Theology Forum in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. So in 2018, he attended the gathering of the Jesuit Companions in Indigenous Ministry in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Currently, he serves as the Associate Director of Blessed Peter Faber Spirituality Center and a member of its board of directors. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pride to present to you Reverend Father Jose Marie J.M. B. Manzano, S.J. Good day to all of you. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, the organizers for giving us this wonderful opportunity to share. So my presentation is entitled, The Way of Contemplation, The Greatest is Love. This is statement, the backward view towards popular religiosity, namely the devotion to the black Nazarene, among others, by some intellectuals actually boosted not only the devotion's popularity, but also its place as bedrock of deep and true Christian faith. I would like to give an outline to my presentation. We start, as it were, from the bird's eye point of view, which is the point of view of God's agape, which refers to the true and perfect love, which is captured in the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13. The be-all and end-all, the quintessential element, the summit of all journeys, is God's agape, or love of God. No wonder Jesus has made it the first commandment of love. Benedict XVI says that faith, worship, and ethos are interwoven as a single reality which takes shape in our encounter with God's agape. Commandment of love is only possible because it is more than a requirement. Love can be commanded because it has first been given. This experience of God's agape is very possible in our earthly life. To relish is through the spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius of Loyola. I will draw particular attention to the two pivotal prayer exercises called the first principle and foundation and the contemplation to attain love. The bird's eye viewpoint is akin to the first principle and foundation, while the path on the ground, which leads towards God's agape, is akin to the contemplation to attain love. Secondly, is the person of Hans Urs von Balthasar and his three pathways cosmological, anthropological, in the pathway of love. Bon Balthazar, in the words of Henry de Lubac, was a fervent disciple of Saint Ignatius of Loyola. He joined the Society of Jesus as a young man and left from it in 1950 because of a mission to start a secular institute. He attempted in his final years to rejoin the Society of Jesus. He used to say to people that he is like a blind man 
relying on Saint Ignatius as his guide dog. In my paper, Bon Balthazar II is my very reliable guide dog. Thirdly, I will share about a religious experience of mine in Quiapo Church 10 years ago in February of 2012. Fourth and last are my concluding remarks using Bon Balthazar's image of a mother and child relationship. At the heart of this discourse is the practice of faith through imaginative contemplation and prayer following the Ignatian tradition. Strong's definition of faith, pistis, as God's divine persuasion, is distinct from human confidence, optimism, or belief. God's attitude towards a person bears the dignity of partnership, loving relationship, or covenant, if you may, with someone that God pursues and delights in without disregarding human freedom. Benedict XVI writes that faith is not merely a personal reaching out towards things to come that are still totally absent. It gives us something. Hans Urs von Balthasar in the same vein holds that this something, the central form of evidence on which all else depends, is the perception of Jesus Christ's objective form as God, a form which is not believed but rather seen, however much we continue believing in Christ. Von Balthasar writes that if God wishes to reveal the love that he harbors for the world, this love has to be something that the world can recognize in spite of or in fact in its being wholly other. The inner reality of love can be recognized only by love. God's agape has an ungraspable dimension and all images fail in fathoming. I would like us to turn to Saint Gregory of Nyssa who has this dynamic image of unending love, epectasis the doctrine of unceasing progress and eternal happiness. This alludes to St. Paul's Epictinominus tus emprostein in his letter to the Philippians. It means stretching in front of time. And this is one recognizable dimension of the dynamism of God's agape. We come to the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, which is my current ministry. The summit of the retreat journey is reached through the contemplation to attain love, where the famous Sushipe or take Lord and receive prayer is found. In that contemplation, the retreatant awakens to a love that has already begun way back in the beginning of time, initiated by a loving and transcendent God. And the retreatant surrenders in love one's liberty memory, understanding, and entire will. Before reaching the goal, the retreatant walks along a labyrinthine path of love, a path that will accord him or her both the freedom to totally surrender to God's self-gift of unending love and the freedom from disordered desires and inordinate attachments, which, in essence, the stumbling block, scandalon, along the pathway of love, blocking the epithesis of love. However, before we can truly receive any gift from God, we have to discover and purify our deepest desire through mind, heart, body, and soul. The spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius is a pathway that involves these. Right before the first principle and foundation is a long heading which serves like a mission statement for everyone who would like to enter. It says, Spiritual exercises to conquer oneself and regulate one's life without determining oneself through any affection that is disordered. 
God is the author of all desires and God desired all of God's creatures first. And man responds through desire as shown in the first principle and foundation. We are created to praise, reverence, and serve our ever-present God and Lord. And by these means, to achieve our eternal well-being. Many experts say that for St. Ignatius, the problem was not desiring too much, but rather it was desiring too little what ought to be desired. Juan Balthazar is not only considered a great theologian, but a dramatic theologian. His major multi-volume trilogy of the glory of the Lord, Theodrama and Theologic, presents, above all, a dramatic and contemplative theology. Thanks to a dramatic saint, St. Ignatius, who exerted so much influence throughout all of his works, which all have a contemplative dimension. He believes that the greatest theological works have been produced in an environment of prayer and imaginative contemplation. That is how von Balthasar understands the nature of theology. Theologies are not born, they are made. And the mission of theology as disinterested doer of the word through obedience of faith. Henry de Lupa quotes von Balthasar when he said, The proud spirits who never pray and who today pass for torchbearers of culture vanish with regularity after a few years and are replaced by others. Those who pray are torn by the populace that does not pray, like Orpheus torn by Menas. But even in their lacerations, their song is still heard everywhere. And if because of their ill use by the multitude, they seem to lose their influence, they remain hidden in a protected place where, in the fullness of time, they will be found once again by men of prayer. The practice of Ignatian contemplation, also known as imaginative contemplation, is likened to the faith experience of the three apostles at the transfiguration of Jesus. My favorite painting of the transfiguration is the one by Saiger Koder. Three figures look at each other, Elijah, Moses, and Jesus, in such a way as to form a circle, a union. Benedict XVI used the transfiguration encounter in Sacramentum Caritatis to refer to the seductively captivating beauty that is likewise beheld in every liturgical celebration. Benedict XVI says, the concrete way in which the truth of God's love in Christ encounters us, attracts us, and delights us, enabling us to emerge from ourselves and drawing us towards our true vocation, which is love. The memorial of Jesus' redemptive sacrifice contains something of that beauty which Peter, James, and John beheld when the Master making his way to Jerusalem, was transfigured before their eyes. God allows himself to be glimpsed first in creation, in the beauty and harmony of the cosmos. In the Old Testament, we see many signs of the grandeur of God's power as he manifests his glory in his wondrous deeds among the chosen people. In the New Testament, this epiphany of beauty reaches definitive fulfillment in God's revelation in Jesus Christ. Christ is the full manifestation of the glory of God. End of quote. Von Balthasar is fond of quoting too Saint Anselm who wrote, I cannot seek you if you do not teach me how, nor find you if you do not show yourself. Von Balthasar distinguishes three pathways to which theologians have approached God's revelation, namely the cosmological, the anthropological, and the pathway of love. 
He describes his method or path of contemplative theology as a constant return to the center, a return marked both by faith and academic rigor, a return to the original simplicity, Jesus Christ himself. What is very distinctive in Bon Balthasar's reading of St. Ignatius is this faith perspective of prayer. The first, argues von Balthasar, is looking at the truth about God in Jesus Christ cosmologically or vis-a-vis -vis the race of divine truth latent in creation, which are also reflected and practiced by pagan religions and contemplated by philosophers, albeit in partial and limited ways. Balthasar calls the first approach cosmological reduction. He argues that the cosmological pathway is deficient seen as a deviation, a digression, which is further compromised by the great desolation of the Reformation, triggered by a narrowly conceived and controversial notion of faith, the cosmological pathway lost its grip, and this ushered in the human person to become the pivotal point. A second basic approach to God's revelation is the anthropological pathway. Christian apologists adopt the rhetoric of an I thou dialogue. Von Balthasar calls this the anthropological reduction, which is worrisome for him, especially when it leads to modernism. That integration, integralism of abstract ecclesial opinions, which could not integrate the multiplicity of dogmas into a spiritual and intellectual unity, but could only use brute force in an effort to overpower its opponents. Von Balthasar maintains that Catholic dogmatic theology has been ensnared by this, and therefore, in the spiritual exercises, St. Ignatius is not concerned with a path to perfection which was the pitfall of some of the apostles, and for which Peter was reprimanded harshly by Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block, scandal unto me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. The two pathways, cosmological and anthropological, could be summarized through the contemplation of the rich young man. The Gospel of Mark highlights Jesus' look of love on the person as God's offer of friendship, which is always an astonishing possibility and transcends anything one could anticipate or expect. The young man goes away sad because he had many inordinate desires. The man faces a breaking point where he does not know anymore what his true identity is. He is lost in the multiplicity of his conflicting interior desires, and which becomes his nair. We come to the third pathway, the pathway of love, which is the dynamic or living integration of the cosmological, anthropological, among others. It is not static in form, and neither it is utterly enigmatic. This is characteristic of the living dynamism like St. Gregory of Nyssa's Epictesis. In love alone is credible, I quote, everything in fact must be interpreted in terms of love and not in the final analysis in terms of consciousness or spirit or power or pleasure and desire or utility. Nothing in the church born Balthazar writes, not even the church herself, can lay claim to an autonomous form that would compete with the Christ form or even replace it. Nor is it as if through the sacraments of formless grace, so to speak, the fundamental figure of grace is Jesus Christ himself, and all sacramental forms are grounded in his form in a most concrete sense. Faith is more than a personal conviction, a personal reaching out. Benedict XVI asserts in Spes Salvi. I learned about the deep meaning behind this assertion during an eight-day retreat. I went through a deep crisis of faith. Moved by the Spirit, 
Mary Tritai told me not to read anything, even the Bible, and instead go to Kiapa Church. The ardent faith of the devotees taught me that personal conviction alone is not secure. It is shaky, dangerous, because of what St. Ignatius calls the angel of light, the false lover who deceives. In his spiritual exercises, we read about the angel of light. At first, he will suggest good and holy thoughts, and then, little by little, he strives to gain his own ends by drawing the soul into his hidden deceits. Even in matters of the sacred scriptures, the enemy dethroned me, saying that I was not better off than he, and he knew from Adam everything in the Bible. He bombarded me with all the lies until it became more and more difficult for me to convince my mind otherwise. And all my personal convictions about myself and my God suddenly collapsed. That was when I learned that personal conviction is very shaky and insecure. For all of us who would be retreatants and retreat guides, take this word of caution from St. Ignatius. Contemplation must not get stuck in the intellect. For gnosis puffs up, but love builds up. All the seeing and the hearing must result in a touching, a getting near to God. And the one praying must be totally taken up with what the divine persons are doing. I realized then that I could not trust my own thoughts anymore. My retreat guide told me not to read anything but just go to Kiapa Church. So why I attended the Mass and contemplated the many devotees there I encountered, he told me to use the Ignatian prayer tool called application of the senses. Indeed, the five senses have sensations that the mind cannot manufacture. After the Mass, when the lay minister approached to sprinkle holy water upon the people coming from various walks of life, I was deeply touched by their sincere acts of devotion, expressions of deep love for the black Nazarene. I remember seeing a woman who raised a pile of books and a few pens to be blessed. I surmised these were her reviewers and writing materials for an upcoming licensure exam. In my contemplation of her, the mirror image of the hemorrhagic woman who touched the tassel of Jesus' cloak suddenly flashed in my consciousness with the words, Who touched me? At that instant, I saw Jesus' eyes through the devotee's eyes. There were countless others who were praying ardently with tears all over their faces. And like the throngs of people who followed Jesus on earth, we all fervently believed. When I came back home that day and served at the evening Mass at the Jesuit community where I was staying for my retreat, during the post-communion, I was cleaning and wiping the chalice, and behold, what flashed in my mind are memories during the Last Supper of our Lord. I felt in my hands the sacredness, splendor, and beauty of the linen and chalice. My mind nor the enemy cannot make me doubt these anymore. I told myself. They brought me back to the ultimate proof of the existence of Jesus, who made all this possible, really, doubtlessly, the one who instituted everything in his great love, undisputedly in the flesh. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. After that, the thick cloud of doubt evaporated. At that point, I knew I was brought out of the abyss of the darkest spiritual blindness. Thanks to the simplicity of Jesus, the substantial proof of our Christian faith, the substance of things hoped for, the proof of things not seen. I would like to conclude with a distinctive image in Balthazar's work where love manifesting itself in deeds than in words. That is, in our first experience after we were born, the face of the love of our mothers. After a mother has smiled for some time at her child, it will begin to smile back, von Balthasar writes. 
she has awakened love in its heart. And in waking the child to love, she awakens also recognition. The I encounters for the first time the Thou, and the Thou smiles in a relationship of love. The play of love has been started by the child's mother. In the same way, God explains himself before man as love. Love radiates from God and instills the light of love in the heart of man, precisely a light in which he can perceive this absolute love. But just as no child can awaken to love until it is loved, no human heart can come to the knowledge of God without the free gift of His grace, the image of His Son. Thank you. Thank you, Father J.M. Manzano. The topics of our distinguished plenary speakers and paper presenters hopefully provided us the opportunity to understand the depths and no one uh, and no one's the rituals, the lips, practices, and experiences of the devotees of the Black Nazarene. Uh, these do not just entail religious and academic facets, but also cross-cultural, social media, and historical aspects that describe, compare, explain, and interpret the Christian faith of the Black Nazarene devotions. Continuing with our two more remaining paper present presenters, the next paper presentation is titled Juxtaposing Devotion and Cinemas, The Devotion to the Black Nazarene and Lino Brocas Bona. Our paper presenter is an associate professor and graduate program coordinator of the Department of Philosophy at the Ateneo de Manila University. He has been researching on the devotion to the Black Nazarene uh, for the past six years and did a postdoctoral fellowships in Tübingen and Gavingen and Bergen. He was the past president of the Philosophical Association of the Philippines. He also teaches philosophy and theology at the Ateneo de Manila University uh, in, and also in many religious and diocese and seminars. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Dr. Mark Joseph P. Calano. Hello and good day to everyone. Um, I'm John Valiant Jordan, an undergraduate student of De La Salle University, and I will be Good, more, good afternoon. I'm, uh, I'm presenting my paper entitled Juxtaposing Devotion and Cinemas, the Devotion to the Black Nazarene and the Film Bona. In order to, to make my case, I will follow uh, this outline for this afternoon. Uh, first, I look at the, the case of Bona. Uh, well, I provide an introduction. And then after an introduction, I will look at the case of Bona, the movie, uh, Nora Honor's movie, 1980, Lina Broca, um, and, and, pre and present her as a model or a stereotype of a devotee. There are plenty of devotees, and that Bona is just one of them. And then I try to look at the distinction, the play between the secular and the sacred, and then look at negotiated love. What do we mean by a love that's negotiated? And then end with a conclusion. Allow me to begin with an introduction. When you look at the devotion to the Black Nazarene, it's very easy to understand it.
made that movies are also uh, something that are that is watched but i think more than it being viewed or viewed or watched uh, what i wanted to propose is that effective watching of the movie uh, based is based on the fact that it draws something similar or familiar deep inside you and that the same is the case with the performance of religious performances religious performances actually tap on the familiar but also at the same time draws you to something more and 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 that the religious performances as as well as the cinemas are, are as well as the movies are actually filled with um, symbols that somehow speaks to the audience relates to the audience so when religious performances therefore is understood as performances i'm not talking about something theatrical or perform uh, but instead something that is done performative in that case uh, and in the same way that cinemas though uh, are also uh, something that is done religious performances are cultural performances of the local and therefore manifesting what is really local endemic unique uh, to the people in film studies also the local is concerned not with uh, fabricating spaces or creating spaces no um, cinemas actually the power of the cinemas is based on the fact that they're drawn from the lived environment of the people and that's the reason why people watching these movies uh, can resonate can even understand what's going on shell in 2001 speaks of the cinema as a linguistic symbolic system that constitutes the spatial form of culture uh, visual form even particularly uh, it reflects urban spaces, lifestyles, and human conditions. When you look at, for example, uh, indie films in the 20th century and 21st century, and when they speak of it as poverty porn, that's basically because there's no attempt to put an icing on the cake and to simply show the roughness of the scenario, uh, of the situation, of the phenomena that is being portrayed. In this case, when we look at uh, the Black Nazarene, no, we, we need to understand that uh, understanding the devotion to the Black Nazarene to a certain extent requires us to put our attention on the persons that are involved, the bodies that are involved, more than concepts, more than ideas. We're more interested with the persons that are involved. And when we start looking at the body, the, the katawan, the, the real body, uh, we come to a point wherein we recognize physical, psychological, even material dimensions of everyday life expressed in the body, you know, manifested in the body, embodied even. Space, therefore, is always embodied, created by a moving and speaking body that is also, whether you like it or not, uh, not spiritual as it a soul but spatially oriented by using low's uh, understanding i am trying to understand the dua or break even the duality and the disparity between the objective and the subjective the sacred and the secular the physical and the representational that somehow might have neglected the body as the location for speaking and acting on the world uh, in this case too, you'd see that there is an emphasis on the slum, no? but, but we need to take into consideration what we mean by the slum. No? Uh, the paper that I'm presenting right now is actually part of a twofold paper about movies and the Black Nazarene. No? One about Bona, the other about Tirador. No? Very extreme movies, but all of them focus on the slums, uh, precisely because Bona lived in the slums, the Tiradors is, uh, live in the slums. But uh, we need to understand also that that context affects their everyday performances. In another paper, I argued that many of the informalities in the performance of the devotion to Kiapo is brought about by the fact that uh, not only is Kiapo a hodgepodge of many people um, the informality is presented by the fact that many of the devotees of Kiapo are actually drawn or coming from the urban poor uh, there's nothing wrong with that 
uh, and that's basically what I'm arguing here, uh, they should not be understood simply as informal, no? uh, but instead we need to be able to go into their lives just so we can understand what's going on. The paper that the paper that I'm trying to present will try to articulate analogies, if you will, analogies, similarities between religious and cinematic devotion, uh, considering three aspects. First, uh, the character of Bona as a fan, but also, as I, I argue, as a devotee. The fan devotee divide is very important for me because uh, the devotion that Bona represent uh, manifests to the actor that he follows, gives her, her life to, um, also in one way or another constitutes the type of devotion that she is involved in. And that's the reason why uh, when there's no longer any distinction between fandom and devotion, then I will start addressing the issue of the secular and the sacred, but also at the same time uh, address the concept of negotiated love. Let's look at Bona, no? uh, who is Bona? And uh, why is Bona or understanding Bona very important? First things first, Bona is a Bona is a Bona is a 1980 film, no? Uh, and it's a 1980 film by by Lino Broca, no? Uh, of course, uh, who would not know Lino Broca, considering that uh, he is uh, one of the pillars of Philippine cinema, no? Nagais na ako ng slide, sorry. Uh, so let's look at Bona. No? Uh, the film Bona is portrayed by Nora Honor, revolves around the character whose name the film is entitled, Bona. No? Or quite recently, they refilmed this one and uh, Eugene Domingo uh, in a play, and it was Eugene Domingo who played it. No? Uh, the opening scene introduces her as a devotee to the Black Nazarene, and this is the first juxtaposition and where I actually drew all the reflections from, that it opens basically showing Bona as a devotee, no? uh, as well as a movie fan, though. When, while little is said of the former, that she is a devotee, investigating her fandom, her devotion, uh, she can shed light on the nature of her devotedness. There is a porousness that crosses over between fandom and devotion. Bona is a gendered and an age-based characterization of fanhood. Um, obviously, it is a stereotype articulation of a hysteric, well, that's how many people will call them, uh, with an excess, of course, who is both immature and incontinent. In the movie, uh, Bona offers herself to Gardo, played by Philip Salvador, a budding action star. She insists to live with him in the slums despite her father's disapproval. By offering herself, she is left uncompensated for cooking and keeping house to trailing in the film set where she carries his bags, wipes his bro, and stands ever at the ready to light his cigarette. Gardo is the object of servitude and is overvalued. He is, in fact, devalued. The inappropriate importance given by Bona demonstrates practices that constitutes her engagement with Gardo. With her servitude, Bona demonstrates her resilience. Interestingly, she adjusts quickly to the life with Gardo in the slums. A scene even demonstrates her waiting in line with other residents at the communal tap and carries heavy containers back to Gardo's shop. Her daily ritual with water, from collecting to even heating water, in the film uh, is pronounced by water shortage, manif manifests really a conspicuous act of fan sacrifice um, as it is afforded Gardo the luxury of hot bath. Despite so, Gardo remains oblivious of Bona's feelings and unappreciated of her efforts. When you look at uh, devotees to the Black Nazarene, there is also in one way or another a seeming a similarity, whether you like it or not. For one, there's an offering of oneself. No, A devotee offers herself um, and does things for, uh, for the poon. Di ba? Uh, but not only that, uh, many people, uh, uh, we wipe uh, the poon, pinupunasan, hinahawakan. That's why even uh, Bishop Claver will speak of the poon as of uh, panyotwalyat spirituality because we actually are spirituality of touching. 
of tactile manifestations. But we also carry the poon in the same way that Bona carries the bags of gardo. We pull the poon. We work for the for the poon. In fact, the poon is the object of servitude. And many people, critics who do not understand it, would say it's an overvalued system. It's just a piece of food, they'd say. It's devalued in the same way that Gardo is understood to be devalued. Um, and uh, this will also demonstrate uh, bonus resilience in the same way that uh, participating in the devotion uh, also demonstrates the resilience of the devotees. Interestingly, the adjustments are quick uh, too uh, on our behalf. No? Uh, and that's the reason why you'd see how people actually uh, adjust, uh, even if uh, people does not always seem to recognize uh, what is going on. Both Bona, uh, going back to the movie Bona, Bona serves as Gardos Alalai, which is also understood as aid, helper, and assistant. This certainly goes beyond menial, servile, and even the feminine connotations evoked by the word. Bona's portrayal as Alalai inevitably, whether you like it or not, includes the untenable form of female exploitation and servitude in her reduction to an unpaid, emotionally abused, and sexually available female domestic servant. But we need to understand that uh, that's very important to recognize Nora Honor. No? The, the, the affiliation of people to Nora Honor is that uh, it's common, she's common tao. No? Uh, she's like an ordinary person who made it to the scene. And, and that's the reason why there are many, many Nora, Nora, Nora Nyans, uh, even right now. Uh, the skin color uh, resonates that. No? It's easy to synect the Kai's bonus brown skin to the black Nazarene and to the millions of its devotees. It's the color of the skin of the majority of fans as well as devotees. Kasi babad sa araw. This is also true of the skin color of the cargador, porter, the utusan, housemaid, the mangagawa, worker, the lavandera, washerwoman, or even the mamamasan or the devotee. With its emphasis on low income informal work, this exemplifies the continuing prominence of the urban poor among the devotees, as I said. Uh, so uh, there are more that I spoke about the relationship between Bona and Gardo in the movie, as well as in the Tirador. But uh, because I only have 20 minutes, I'll go now to the sacred and the secular. Many of us look at the sacred and the secular as something that are separate from each other or even treat them separately. But it's very difficult to do that because we're not simply soul, we're not simply body, we're embodied spirits. Or we're not the, what the body is entailed with in everyday lives. It's also what is carried forward in devotion. When you are able to recognize that your everyday affairs cannot be distinguished from your religiosity, that's the time that we see very clearly why uh, there are instances of split-level Christianities, if I may use Jaime Bulatao's reference of it. But when we look at the play between the sacred and the secular, we actually come to a point wherein we recognize a very unique type of spirituality where there seems to be a working in, a weaving of the sacred and the secular. When you watch Tirador, for example, these are people who are devotees of the Black Nazarene, but also at the same time still uh, part of uh, activities that are perceived to be illegal. And, and yet, also at the same time, they do not see any distinction. It's very important that uh, to recognize that even in the field, they still can recognize uh, the need for prayer. No, uh, There is an interview that I watched last time about a devotee who said, uh, God is not yet done with us. And, and that we are still in the process of conversion. And I like that a lot. No, The recognition that there's a continuous attempt to integrate one's spirituality with one's life plays a very important role in trying to understand really how my everyday affairs of cooking, of dealing with others, or living in shacks uh, does in fact manifest also the very devotion that I have no, and that there are no distinctions between the two. Um, the play is more clear in people who do not think about it, but in people who live it, and and that's the reason why uh, there is a sense of authenticity 
in the performance of the devotion to the Black Nazarene, uh, an authenticity that, that is not always studied in theology. Uh, an authenticity where the poon remains to be the center of their lives, but also an authenticity that situates them uh, in the very context limitations of their lives. Uh, which leads me now to the third part of the paper, because I only have more or less eight minutes left, if this is going to be a 25-minute presentation. And uh, that's when I start talking about negotiated love. No? Uh, Bona always manifests itself as servitude. In fact, in Bona, you see the extreme servitude, because when she was, she, when she was not able to receive any uh, manifestation of uh, a manifestation of love from Gardo, she will even push herself to the point of, uh, in fact, harming Gardo. No, bubusan niya ng mainit na tubig. No, she will pour hot water on Gardo uh, at the end of the movie. But but those are excesses unto itself. So allow me to discuss this uh, negotiated love in terms of three things. First, the excesses. Fandom and devotion are both excesses, whether you like it or not. There's no moderation in devotion or in fandom. When you notice people who have fans and things like that, uh, or who are also devoted to something, uh, this devotion and this fandom are always manifested in terms of excesses. The panata is excessive, you know, whether you like it or not. And, and, and you can see that specifically in the offering of life, of effort, energy, and all of the mamamasan in the translation. People give their all. And that's the very first thing that I want to show. It will look excessive because it is excessive. And, and excess here is a movement of fandom as it is a movement of devotion. Second, there is a desire to serve. Servitude, uh, as you can see in Bona, serving her idol, uh, is also something that is negotiated for what? Servitude as well. Uh, in, uh, it, it's, not an, it's not simply an issue of unrequited love. No? Uh, this is not an issue of unrequited love. This is, in fact, an issue of trying to see further uh, what the servitude is for and and uh and in today's gospel in fact uh well i'm recording this one wednesday um in yesterday's gospel if you're listening to it tomorrow uh today uh thurs uh, if you're listening it uh, tomorrow uh, you'd realize that uh he came to be served not to serve no uh to serve not to be served and I think that's also very important to recognize uh, the, the mutuality, right? To a certain extent, the poon needs you, your hands, your feet. Um, and, and yet also at the same time, you need the poon. Uh, you serve as the hands and the feet of the poon, no? Uh, but, you, but you also uh, need the poon, uh, poon's hands and feet to serve you. There's a sense of, exchange if you will uh, but it is an exchange of servitude uh, it is an exchange of pagiging pagsisilbihan mo uh, kasi pinagsisilbihan ka rin uh, ganung dinamiko yung umiikot dito and it's a dynamics of love i think it's a dynamics of uh, what i call or will call negotiated love uh, yes we negotiate our love in the same way that uh, love negotiates with us. And it's very important to take into consideration the two, uh, not because there's a barter that's involved, uh, because we recognize that uh, we've always received more than we have more. And, and that's very important to consider. When we say we have always received more than, we've, than, than, than we, give, we can give, then, then this is not really an exchange exchange uh, as it is properly represented by utang na loob, di ba? Panata as fueled by utang na loob. But not only that, there's also a sense of tawad, no? Tawad, patawad, di ba? Uh, when you look at the exchange that is involved in market studies, Tawad only exists between friends, uh, people that you are familiar with. 
And when you say tawad only exists in that context, you have to recognize that you cannot tawad negotiate with somebody there's no relationship with. The relationship of uh, the relationship that allows you to to spend less for something you get more happens only in the context of the relationship. That's the reason why devotees and fandom gets favors, for example, uh, favors that are based on a relationship of a relationship that is somehow proven by consistency, a relationship that is proven by, by constancy. And, and that's the reason why uh, I will go to the last part uh, that uh, that at the center of the devotion remains to be the poon, no? uh, our Lord. Uh, we become who we contemplate, right? just as fans uh, look at to their uh, to their uh, idols, even to the point of living their lives after them. We hope that devotion also takes that form, right? uh, to look at Jesus, to to stare at Jesus, to. To, to, uh, to, to allow oneself to, to become obsessed with Jesus. Uh, there is a saying that says, uh, and uh, it's a Jeshua who said it, uh, we become who we contemplate. And that's basically also very important. No? The more we contemplate the Lord, the more we contemplate our idols, the more we become like them. Um, and it's very important that that forgiveness, uh, negotiations happens in that very context. So allow me to summarize the three points I've raised. First, uh, Bona is a devotee. And when you look at Bona, you recognize the excesses of devotion, of fandom, but that these excesses of fandom also to a certain extent express or manifest the degree of devotion that we have. No? Fandom and devotion follows a very similar movement, whether you like it or not. Second, in this uh, play, similarity between fandom and devotion, what we recognize is that there is no separation between the secular and the sacred. If anything, the sacred operates within the secular in the same way that the secular operates within the sacred. There is This is a very porous distinction. And if not, there is even a play that is involved in this movement of the secular and the sacred. And you can see that more clearly in, in, in Tirador, uh, in the movie Tirador, um, but also you can intimate that or clarify that in Bona. And lastly, uh, I've emphasized a very negotiated form of love. And this negotiated form of love is only made possible in the context of a relationship with your idol or in a relationship with your Lord. And uh, negotiation in this sense should never be accepted as something negative, but always uh, understood as a, as a context of love, a context uh, of a type of love that is only made possible in the context of familiarity or in the context of constancy devotion, or better yet, fandom. I'll close my paper here because I have already given my uh, 25 minutes PL, uh, and I hope to clarify questions later on. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you, Dr. Calano, for presenting to us an interesting juxtaposition of religion and popular art cinema. On a lighter note, I was amazed to see the young Philip Salvador and Nora Honor in their younger years in that movie, Bona. But on a serious note, great topic on devotion in the context of interdisciplinary approach of media and gender role discourse in this age of feminism and Women's Month celebration. Very timely in them. For the last paper presentation, we will have a long time volunteer in the minor Basilica of the Black Nazarene. He is the Operations Director of the Tiapo Church Command Center. 
He leads the technical preparation team in ensuring the security of the Black Nazarene Feast and the safety of the devotees. A theologian by education and a patriot by heart, he revived the advocacy for church safety and security in the Philippines. He founded the Emergency Response Integration Center, or ERIC. It's a nonprofit, non government organization that specializes in emergency informatics. Sir Bong leads the ERIC in volunteering its expertise in various humanitarian operations across the country in times of disasters, as well as big church activities during peacetime. Eric serves as an information hub between government agencies and private organizations, local and international, including the United Nations. He also co-authored the three volumes of National Disaster Response Plan, NDRP for Hydrometeorological Events, NDRP for Earthquakes and Tsunami, and NDRP for Terrorism-Related Events which is uh, commissioned and published by Na the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Council or the NDRRMC of the Philippines. At present, he spends his time as a consultant of various organizations in setting up data and communication management for emergency response during disasters and for continuing development during this time. Presenting his paper titled, Calvary to Cavalry, Continuing persecution of the Nazarian, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Christopher P. Graho. He will be presenting to us live. Your reverences, bishops, monsignores, fathers, brothers, sisters, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. For almost two days, we have been discussing the divine. May I please invite you now to dip your feet once more on the mundane. My paper is originally written in English but please do allow me to deliver it in conversational Filipino as we need to reach more people. Sa nakalipas na dalawang araw, narinig po natin ang mga kwento, pananaw, at doktrina, mga aral, nagagabay sa atin sa landas tungo sa kabananan. Ang mga ganitong panayam ay sadyang nagbibigay ng natatanging saya at kapayapaan ng puso. Konsolasyon, ika nga. Ano pa nga ba ang hihigit na kasiyahan kaysa mapalapit tayo sa Panginoong Diyos sa kabila ng ating mga pagkukulang at kalabisan? Pero alam niyo po ba, sa kabila ng diwa ng kabutihan, kabanalan at pakikipagkapwa-tao na binubuhay ng debosyon kay Pungong Yesus Nazareno, Mayroong nag-iisip na ipatigil ang debosyon na ito at patayin ang mga deboto. Taliwas po sa palagay ng mga nakararami, sinubukang bombahin ang kapistahan ng Nazareno noong 2012. Maraming hindi makapaniwala ang kanilang reaksyon. Ha? 
Bubumbahin ang pista ng Nazareno? Pwede ba yun? Grabe naman. Subalit, ito po ay totoong nangyari. Sa katunayan, mula sa isang kapistahan ng parokya, ito ay naging isang national security event. At sa loob lamang ng ilang oras, ang Pangulo mismo ng bansa na nooy si Ginoong Benigno Aquino III, ang siya mismo ang nagtungo at nagipagtulong na sa nooy kura paroko, Monsenyor Clemente Ignacio. Dumagsa ang kapulisan, ang kasundaluhan, at hindi na po nagbago yan hanggang sa mga sumunod na taon. 2012, nairaos po ng mapayapa ang kapistahan ng Nazareno sa pangangalaga ng dating DILG Secretary, Jesse Robredo. Subalit, iyon palang pala ang simula ng pagharap ng dibosyon ng Nazareno sa seryosong banta sa kapayapaan at kabanalan. Noong 2012, walang nahuling salarin. Pero natagpuan ng mga kagamitan. Lingit po sa kaalaman ng nakararami, taon-taon ay lumalaki at tumitindi ang banta sa kaligtasan ng Nazareno at mga deboto. Noong 2012, Simpleng IED lamang, improvised explosive device na mayroong cellphone trigger ang natagpuan ng mga alagad ng batas. Ng mga sumunod na taon, nasundan ito ng mga granada at ng mga 81mm mortar rounds. Pero ang nakakagimbal sa lahat, taong 2015, natagpuan ang isang 105mm high explosive round, ito po ay bala ng kanyon na karaniwan natin nakikita sa comics o sa pelikula. Ganito ang paghahanda na ginawa ng mga masasamang loob para sirain ang ating kapistahan. Noong mga panahong iyon, pagitan ng 2012 at 2015, napakahirap pong pawiniwalaan ang mga kwentong ito. Lalo na para sa iba, tila suspect sa lamang allegations o anecdotal. Iyan rin po ang naging suliranin ng technical team upang kumbinsihin ang ilang mga pinuno sa simbahan man, sa pamahalaan at pati sa mga deboto na sadyang may nakaambang panganib sa kapistahan ng Nazareno. Nagbago po ang lahat noong 2019 nang ang banta ay magkaroon ng mukha. Ano po ang ibig kong sabihin? Habang naghahanda po ng kapaskuhan ang buong bansa, ang buong kakristyanohan, ang dating police colonel na ngayon ay General Vicente Danao Jr. pinamunuan ang mga kawani ng MPD, AFP at NICA sa pagmamanman sa mga kilalang terorista sa Maynila. At noon ng December 23, nang taon din iyon, si Sudais Asma o Asmad ay inaresto sa gawi ng binondo. At nasundan ito noong araw mismo ng Kapaskuhan, December 25, dinakip si Jeran Aba alias Paito. Napag-alaman sa mga investigasyon ng mga terorist ng nadakip ay halos isang taon nang ipinadala sa Maynila upang aralin ang gawi ng pumumuhay ng mga mamamayan. Aralin ang pasikot-sikot sa Quiapo at lalo higit aralin ang ruta ng prosesyon ng poong Nazareno. Matapos ang Marawi Siege noong 2017, nabatid natin lahat Nabatid natin na ang lahat ng ito ay kalakip o bahagi ng malaking plano ng mga tagasunod ng ISIS dito sa Pilipinas. Ngayon parang balik tanaw na lang ito. Pero nung mga panahon na yon, napakahirap itong pag-usapan at lalong mahirap paniwalaan. Higit pa na napatunayan ang kanilang presensya sa Pilipinas 
Noong ang mga kasapi ng ISIS mula sa ibang bansa ang siyang nagsagawa ng malagin na pagpapasabog sa Mount Carmel Cathedral sa hulo. Dalawang simana matapos ang kapistahan ng Kiapo. Ito po ay naganap noong 27 January 2019. Masusi, detalyado, mataga at pangmatagalan ang kanilang pagpaplano. Maitanong natin, ano ang kanilang hangarin? Wasakin ang mga simbolo, ang mga imahin ng pananampalataya. Maghasik ng gulo at takot upang patigilin ang mga debosyon. Pag sinabi po nating simbahan, hindi lamang tinutukoy ang simbahan ng kristyano-katoliko, sa Larawan makikita natin ang Grand Mosque at Cathedral ng Marawi na kapwa sira. At ang kahindik-hindik sa lahat, ang kanilang pamamaraan, pagpatay. Sa lungat sa alam nating rules of engagement at war conventions, sa halim na pangalagaan at huwag idamay, sadyang tinatarget ng ISIS ang mga non-combatants, mga sibilyan, mga bata, kababaihan, at mga payapang pamayanan. Halina po, tingnan natin pabalik, balik tanaw, ang nangyari sa uh, Boston Marathon noong 2013. Ang nangyari sa Nice, France, habang nagdiriwang sila ng Bastille Day noong July 14, 2016. Ang nangyari pag-atake sa uh, train uh, sa train station sa St. Petersburg, Russia. Ang lahat po ng ito ay upang maghasik ng takot sa mga mamamayan. Iisipin po natin kung natuloy ang pagpapasabog sa Kiapo. Ito pong 81 mm mortar round na nakuha sa may luneta at sa may tapat ng uh, US Embassy ay mayroong impact distance na 30 to 125 meters. Paano kung dito ito pinasabog? Na-imagine niyo po ba? Samantala, ang 105 mm howitzer high explosive ay may impact coverage na 65 Hanggang 265 meters. Paano kung dito ito ginamit? Alalahanin din po natin na ang uri ng bombang ito na bala ng kanyon ay kayang magpaguho ng tulay katulad ng dinaraanan sa Jones Bridge. At kaya rin magpaguho ng gusali ng simbahan. Idagdag pa natin, higit na marami ang masasaktan, masusugatan o mamamatay sa stampi na posibleng mangyari katulad ng nangyari sa Wawawi. Mga kapatid, kung natuloy ang pag-atake sa kapistahan ng Nazareno, maraming diboto ang masasaktan. Posibleng maging meet sa ito ng pagiging pagkawala ng tiwala sa pagitan ng mga Muslim at mga Kristiyano. Sa ibang bansa, tinawag itong Islamophobia. Maaaring magbunso dito ng panibagong hidwaan sa mga komunidad ng mga Kristiyano at Muslim na sa Maynila, magkasamang namumuhay ng payapa. Kung nangyari ang pagsabog sa kapistahan ng Nazareno, kakalat sa buong mundo ang balita Massacre sa Quiapo, Maynila. Marami ang mag-iisip, magulo ang Pilipinas, tila hindi kayang pangalagaan ng gobyerno ang kaniyang mamamayan, sa labas pa lang naman ang kanyang palasyo. Mawawala ang kumpiyansa ng iba't ibang bansa at hindi na sila makikipagnegosyo pa sa Pilipinas. Ang kaguluhan Magtutuloy-tuloy ang destabilisasyon hanggang bumagsak ang gobyerno, ang ekonomiya, hanggang ang Pilipinas ay maging isang failed state 
Katulad ng nangyari sa Libya, Syria at Iraq. Ito po ang kanilang pangarap. Salamat na lamang sa Diyos at may mga tao nagtulong-tulong. Whole of nation approach or one. Ito ay isang konsepto ng management na ginagamit ngayon sa emergency response. Ang pagtutulungan ng event sponsor katulad dito sa okasyon ito ng simbahan, ng mga ahensya ng gobyerno at ng mga napakaraming volunteers mula sa iba't ibang simbahan o relihiyon, kristyano man at islam, katoliko man, iglesia ni Cristo, born again, lalaki man o babae, nakababata man o nakatatanda, taga siyudad man o mga probinsyano. Lahat nagtulong-tulong para itaguyod ang ligtas at payapang pagdidibusyon. Brothers and sisters, The story of the Nazarene that we celebrate in Quiapo started along the road to Calvary. 2,000 years thereafter, his faithful followers are continuously being persecuted. The situation can rightfully be viewed in many different lenses, tulad ng mga inilahad sa research conference na ito. But for a lowly devotee, it is just another ploy of the evil one to stop them from believing and following Jesus, the Black Nazarene. Towards this end, please allow me to present practical steps to guide our communities, our parishes, our basilicas, not only in Quiapo, but in the entire country. Apat na practical na hakbang. Una, maging mulat sa lengguahe ng mga emergency managers, this is no longer a question of if, but a question of when. Nung mga panahon na ginagawa po ito, ang karaniwang tugon na nakukuha namin, church attacks sa Pilipinas, hindi mangyayari yan. Imposible. Sinong matinong tao ang gagawa niyan? Pero kung tatanungin si General Wesley Clark na dating Supreme Commander ng NATO Forces sa Europe at naging may akda rin ng pagpapanibago ng konsepto ng pakikipagdigma sa mga ekstremista. Ayon sa kanya, ang ating kamangmangan o kahambugan sa pagharap sa issue ang siyang nagiging hadlang para harapin natin ang bagong uri ng terorism, ng terorismo, ang tinatawag nating mga religious extremists, kabilang po ang ISIS. Si Father Chito Sugano, tumalangit na wa ang kanyang kaluluwa, uh, dinakip at naging bihag ng mga ISIS sa, sa Marawi. Siya ang kauna-unahang nagbigay ng tuwirang babala sa lahat ng mga simbahan. Ang mga ekstremista, naghahanda, aatakihin nila ang ating mga simbahan isang araw. Hindi ko puso katakalain, hindi lang pala simbahang katoliko, katulad ng nangyari sa St. Mary Cathedral sa Marawi, ang mangyayari, na sinira ang mga imahin, kundi pati na rin ang mga simbahan o mga moske ng mga kapatid natin sa Islam. Katulad ng nangyari sa Grand Al-Nuri Mosque at mayroon ding Al-Habda Minaret. Ang tanyag na Al-Habda Minaret, kung meron tayong Leaning Tower of Pisa, ito naman po yung nakatagilid din na ang katumbas sa simbahang katoliko ay kampanaryo. Dito naman nananawagan ng mga kapatid natin sa Islam, na magpasimula na ng panalangin. Napakahalaga po nito sa mga kapatid nating Islam. Pero ang historical site na ito na hindi man lang nagalaw ng mga Mongols, ng Otaman at ng mga sundalong Amerikano noong 2003, napabagsak at pinulbos ng mga religious extremists, ng mga ISIS noong 21 June 2017.
Matutunan din po natin ang karanasan sa St. Mark Cathedral, isang uh, tanyag historical, cultural, na simbahan ng mga Coptic Christians sa Alexandria, Egypt. Sila po ay inatake ng makailang beses sa panahon na marami ang nagsisimba at nagdarasal dahil sa okasyon ng kapistahan at kapaktuhan. Pinakamatindi po dyan yung 2017 na uh, Palm Sunday. Sa Asia, noon pong May 13, 2018, ang pamilyang ito na kilala ng kanilang kapitbahayan na bababait, magtitinong tao, hindi nila alam na radicalized pala ng ISIS at matapos ang kanilang oras ng panalangin, nagyakapan na para bagang magbabiyahe at hindi sila magkikita na matagal, yun pala pupunta sila sa iba't ibang destinasyon, mga simbahang kristyano, katoliko at protestante at pinasabog po nila ang kanilang sarili. Isa pang pinakagimbal-gimbal, ito po ay uh, Easter Sunday. Isang napakalaking pista para sa mga kristyano katoliko. Subalit ang kasiyahan ay napalitan ng lagim ng pasabugin ito sa St. Sebastian Church sa Sri Lanka. Umagang minsa, uh, mag-aalas gis po ng umaga yan nung yan ay nangyari. Marami po ang namatay. Yung isa namang reaction, the other extreme, protecting the church, hindi namin trabaho yan. Sa gobyerno yan, di ba? Eh, <clears throat> Pilipinong Pilipino, di po ba? Pero marahil may pinanggagalingan sila. Dahil, sa Deus Caritas Est, ang butihing Santo Papa Benedict XVI, sinabi niyang, The ordering of the society is the domain of the government. Pero hindi po kaya mas fundamental yung kauna-unahang misyon na ibinigay sa atin. Peter, Peter. Pedro, Pedro. Kalingain mo ang aking kawan. Pangalawa, maging masigasi. Tuloy pa rin ang banta. Akala natin natapos na ang ISIS, natapos na ang maute. Pero two weeks ago, ipinalita po sa national television sa Pilipinas na ang isang maute leader sa butig, Lanao del Sur, Lanao, Lanao, ang siyang na-appoint ngayon na maging emir sa Southeast Asia. Buhay po sila tahimik at patuloy na gumagalaw. Sa panahon ng pandemya, akala natin dahil sarado ang simbahan, walang gulo, walang pagkatake. Mali po. Sapagkat sa ibang bansa, dinedesecrate po ang, ang mga imahen, katulad ng imahen ito ng mahal na ina. Hindi lang po natapos dyan. Sa Northern Ireland, binandalize ang mga simbahan. Katulad nito, na isang historical church na napaka-tandana itong mga walls na ito, itong mga pader na ito. Gayun din po yung mga sagradong uh, objects, mga sagradong imahen, katulad ng uh, katawan, bangkay ni uh, Santa Agatha na kanila pong nilapastangan. Maaaring gawin ito ng mga ekstremista dahil ayon sa mga security experts, mas madaling gawin ang vandalism, mas natipid, mas praktikal. Pero mas malalim ang sugat na iniiwan sa mga mananampalataya. Matuto po sana tayo sa mga Indonesian Catholics. Ano ang ginawa nila? Ayon po kay Professor Pamela Fabe, no, na isang 
uh, financial terrorism and trans organized crime and counterterrorism expert. Sa pagsisimba niya sa Indonesia, sinalubong siya ng mga ushers. Ang akala niya, siya ay gagabayan papunta do sa upuan, pero siya pala ay i-interviewin muna bago sila papasukin sa simbahan. Sinisiguro na, si, na siya ay isang tunay na kristyano at katoliko at walang masamang intensyon na magpasabog o manakit na mag-assassinate sa loob ng simbahan. Ito po ay ginagawa ng mga ordinaryong laiko na pwede rin natin gawin sa mga simbahan natin sa Pilipinas. Pangatlo, magtulungan po tayo palawakin natin ang pagtanaw. Anong ibig ko pong sabihin? Let us learn from the flood. Ang tubig baha pupunta sa lugar na pinakamababa doon maiipon ang tubig. Ganon din ang terorismo. Kung ang isang simbahan ay malakas ang seguridad, hahanap ang isang terorista ng lugar o ng simbahan na mahina o walang seguridad. Let us learn from the past. Noon pong March uh, 31, 2016, sinubukang bombahin ang Baklaran Church. Salamat, hindi nagpad. Pagitan po ng 2016, December at 2017, May, iba-ibang pagkakataon, binomba ang katapat ng Quiapo Church at may mga natagpuang suspicious objects sa Santa Cruz at sa Quiapo Church. Let us learn from this. Matuto na rin po tayo sa karanasan ng multi-site at simultaneous attacks. Hindi na po simpleng pag-atake ang ginagawa ng mga terorista. Halina't matuto tayo sa Mumbai attack noong 2008 sa Paris, France noong 2015 at muli sa Sri Lanka noong 2019. Tatlong simbahan, dalawang hotel, isang isang uh, bahay tuluyan pa. Panghuli, itaguyod natin ang kapayapaan. Nung pabagsak na ang pabagsak na ang uh, mga ISIS sa gitnang silangan, sinabi ng kanilang leader na wag nang pumunta sa Syria ang mga volunteers nito at ang mga warriors niya. Magpunta na lang sila sa Pilipinas. Nais nilang i-level up yung kanilang political war, i-level up into a religious war at dito nila gaganapin sa Pilipinas. Kaya sinimulan nila ito sa isang Samarawi War. Pag-aawain nila ang Muslim at Kristiyano sa Pilipinas. So balit kakaiba ang nangyari. Napakarami nating kwento na narinig. Yung mga Muslim mismo sa Marawi, sila ang nangalaga, nagligtas, nagprotekta doon sa mga Kristiyano na naipit sa loob ng siyudad ng Marawi. Paglabas naman nila, nang makalabas sa Marawi ang mga Muslim, sila naman po ay sinalubo ng mga Kristiyano, sila ay pinalinga, pinakain, binigyan ng matatahanan, pansamantala at inihatid sa mga lugar na nais nilang uwian. Yung mga disaster sa Pilipinas brings the worst to us. Pero yung mga disasters din, katulad nito, brings out the best in the Filipinos. Malakas tayong magkantsawan, depende sa ating regional uh, comfort zone. Pero sa panahon ng disaster, tumatang, tumitindig tayo bilang iisang bansa, hindi po ba? Ginamit din ng mga ISIS yung konsepto ng jihad para malegitimize, para magkaroon legalidad yung kanilang mga ginagawa. Pero ayon mismo kay Manwar Ali, isang dating mandirigma, isa sa mga nag-training ng mga uh, ISIS, kasama na yung mga ISIS recruits galing sa Pilipinas, 
ang jihad pala ay hindi yung pakikidigma. Ang jihad ay yung radical change of heart. Tawagin po natin ito sa Tagalog, pagpapa, pagbabalik loob. Salamat kay Paring Bert, Father Albert Alejo, sa napakalawak at napakalalim na, na discussion patungkol sa loob. Yung jihad, hindi mo radikal dahil sasalungat ka sa natural o sa kagyat na reaksyon ng, ng damdamin na gumanti ka kapag ikay nasaktan. Radikal dahil pipiliin mong magpatawad, pipiliin mong umunawa, pipiliin mong maghanap ng pagkakasundo. Ito ang jihad ayon kay Manwar Ali. At sa ganitong paliwanag, hindi po ba ang jihad ay yung tinatawag nating metanoia sa ating mga kristyano? Hindi ba ito yung pagbabalik loob na tinatawag ni San Agustin kumpara sa dispersyo? Yung pagwawala, pagiging kalap, yung pagbabalik sa loob ng isang tao, doon niya natatagpuan, nananahan ang Diyos na naghihintay sa kanya sa kanyang tuwing pag-uwi. Ito ang tunay na jihad, radikal na pagbabalik loob. Ang tanong ng marami, kaya po ba talaga ito? Totoo po bang nangyayari ito? Halina't pakinggan. Si Suzanne Barakat, naging biktima ang kanyang kapatid ng Islamophobia. Nung kasagsagan ng mga ISIS sa gitnang silangan sa Amerika, naman ang tingin ng mga tao pag is, pag Islam ka pag Muslim ka ikaw ay uh, isang terorista pero nililinaw ng lahat yung ISIS ay hindi Islam at ang Islam ay hindi ISIS pero ganun pa man naging biktima sila ang kanilang angkan pero ang tugon nila let's end the hate sariling atin John Paul II Paglabas niya sa ospital matapos yung attempted assassination sa kanya, saan siya pumunta? Hindi po ba kay Ali Agka doon sa kanyang assassin? Consistent sa kanyang buhay, si John Paul II mula sa kanyang pagiging batang seminarista hanggang sa siya naging Santo Papa, iisa ang kanyang mensahe. Darkness can only be scattered by light. Hatred can only be, can only be conquered by love pwede ang radical change of heart. Natatandaan pa po ba ninyo yung mga terorista noong, 20, uh, noong 9-11? Si Zach Ibrahim, hindi niya tunay na pangalan, anak ng isa sa mga terorista doon. Hindi siya nahiyang magpaliwanag, magpakilala sa kanyang sarili sa isang TED Talk. Pinamin niya, siya ay anak ng isang terorista pero pinipili niya ang kapayapaan. Pwede po ang radical change of heart, hindi ba? Pope Francis, alam natin lahat, Fratelli Tutti, the only future worth building includes everyone. Isali natin sa Tagalog, sa lingwahe ng mga kabataan, sana all. Ito lang po yun. Kung naghahanap ka ng kabutihan, ng kaunlaran, ng kapayapaan, sana all. Huwag mong sarilinin. Sana sa lahat. Yung kabalyero, mula sa mga kwento ng mga kaharian, hanggang sa mga cowboy, hanggang sa panibagong uh, pakikidigma, sila yung mga maginoo, mga gentlemen, ano po, na nagliligtas, nagtatanggol sa mga naaapi. Pero ang lahat ng ito ay may bahid ng karahasan. May bahid ng karahasan. Halina po tingnan ang isang uri ng kabalyero. Ang tagapagtanggol ng pananampalataya sa Jesus pong nasareno na walang ibang kinakapitan kundi ang pag-asa sa nasareno. Mawawala kayong lahat, pero ang nasareno, hindi ako iiwan. Makakalaban ko ang lahat, 
Pero ang tanging dal armas ko ay pag-ibig at pagmamahalan. Ito ang mga bagong kabalyero. Mahirap maunawaan, mahirap maintindihan, pero sila ang tagapagtaguyod ng pananampalataya sa Nazareno. Halina po, matutunan sana natin kung ano ang mensaheng dala nila. Napakahirap, napakabigat. Kaya nga po, kung galit ang itinatanim ng mga religious extremists, ang panawagan ng Nazareno, ang itinim natin ay pag-ibig. Sa lungat ito, sa ating kalikasan, kaya nga kailangan natin ang biyaya ng Diyos. Samo pa sa Salmo, isang pusong tapat sa akin ay likhain. Bigyan mo, O Diyos, ng bagong damdamin. Sa iyong harapan, huwag mong sipayuin. Espiritu mo ang papagharin. Kaawaan po sana tayo ng Jesus pong Nazareno. Magandang hapon po sa lahat. Thank you, Sir Bong, for your very relevant study. In time, we seek peace and strength as we carry our own process to Calvary. I would like to remind our forum participants to kindly accomplish later on the online evaluation so we can send you your certificates. The, onla the online evaluation link will be posted uh, in the chat box before the end of the conference. Uh, we shall now have a five-minute break. During the break, please type your comments and questions for our five paper presenters. And when we resume, by the way, we will have just one last presentation and then we'll proceed with the question and answer. Thank you.
Der nun. Once again, we're back. Earlier, our paper presenter, Dr. Vivencio Balano, has delivered a paper titled Gender, Catholic Social Teaching, and COVID-19 in the Philippines, Analyzing the Social Solidarity of Women Devotees in Two Black Nazarene Facebook Groups. This paper is co-researched by Dean Raul, Raul Roland Sebastian, um, the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Development of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. At this point, we will run Dean Sebastian's input to the same research paper, but before we do that, allow me to give proper introduction to Dean Sebastian. He is the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Development in the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. He received his master's degree in Philippine studies from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and his doctorate degree in public administration from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Manila. Okay, at this point, we will be running Dr. or Dean Sebastian's input to the same research presented earlier by Dr. Devencio Balano. Isang mapagpalang araw po sa ating lahat, mga kapatid. First, allow me to congratulate the conference organizer. Also, thank you so much for accepting our paper, for giving us a chance to share the result of our uh, research titled Gender, Catholic, Social Teaching, and COVID-19 in the Philippines, analyzing the social solidarity of women devotees in two Black Nazarene Facebook groups. Applying sociological and theological perspective on disaster, solidarity and Catholic social teaching as a primary theoretical framework and using online prayers of two Black Nazarene groups, this article attempts to find parallelism between some tenets of Catholic social teachings on solidarity and the online religious experiences 
of selected female members of the traditional Catholic devotion of the Black Nazarene. It attempts to debunk the popular perception that Filipino Catholic women lack social concerns beyond family matters because of their traditional gender role and cannot practice the church teaching solidarity because of lack of catechism of the church social doctrines. The study's analysis revealed that more than two-thirds of the total online prayers did not focus only on the family matters but also on the social concern of the larger community. It showed that despite the ignorance of the official church teaching of solidarity, Catholic female devotees still express strong social solidarity with insignificant others beyond family members. But this form of solidarity is more akin to disaster solidarity and the Filipino value of bayanihan rather than the faith-driven social compassion. This article therefore recommends catechism of the members of the Black Nazarene devotion on Catholic social teachings to nurture the public dimension of their Christian faith and to align the concept of solidarity with the official Catholic teaching. Now, I invite you to listen to my partner, Dr. Bibensho Baliano. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we shall now entertain the questions posted by the viewers through the different social media sites. So I'll just read these things randomly, you know. Um, we have a question here for Mr. John Jordan Bogan. Okay, clarification in your study. So nakalagay po. Is power a social construct? Please clarify the concept of notion of power because it seems that there are many nuances of meanings attached to it. I repeat, uh, is power a social construct? Clarify the concept of the notion of power because it says that there are many nuances of meanings attached to it. This is for Mr. John Jordan Bagan. Um, thank you po for that question. Maraming salamat po. Um, in a sense, because in preliminary na findings ko pa could not really say that it is a social construct. But I am actually delighted na nabanggit niya yung nuances because in fact, merong nuances. There are nuances present dun sa mismo construct of power. So, katulad po ng, well, I will delve in it into later kasi may tanong rin po na isa na nakita ko. Um, these nuances, however, siya yung mga, yung the construct of power in a sense. Pag dinefine siya ng isang tao or pag inak na siya, it, was, it is turned into performance. Magkakaroon talaga ng iba't ibang nuances. Lalo na when you look at it into a full Catholic devotion na viewpoint or yung viewpoint ng kung paano magdebosyon ayon sa tinuturo ng simbahan. So magkakaroon po talaga ng nuances. Alright. Uh, next question is for uh, Dr. Assis, is there a discrepancy between Jesus, the historical figure, and Jesus Christ depicted in the gospel? Is there a discrepancy between Jesus Christ uh, depicted as a historical figure and Jesus depicted in, how Jesus is depicted in the gospel? Marami. <laughs> Kasi you must understand the gospel is a theological reflection 
on the historical Jesus. And any historical reflection, because it's a human historical reflection, can never be completely accurate in its portrayal of, uh, of the historical Jesus. In the same way that our books on Rizal can never completely be a perfect uh, portrait of uh, the national hero. So there will, there will always be simple, precisely a discrepancy between, between them. In fact, even among the four Gospels, iba, iba, iba yung maraming discrepancies, iba, maraming differences. Because the Gospel writers were writing within their own context. In, uh, in theology, is always contextual. We encounter God through our own cultural experience. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, we have another question here for Mr. Balano. How did you arrive at a particular conclusion that these online prayers are not only personal petitions, but include petitions for community? What do you mean by online prayers? Uh, will you please describe the parameters set in your research? How did you arrive at a particular conclusion that these online prayers are not only personal petitions, but they also include petitions for the community? What do you mean by online prayer? Sorry, Mama, it was cut. Can you repeat? Because of the, I think the... All right, sir. I'll reiterate for you. I'll reiterate the question. How did you arrive at a particular conclusion that the online prayers are not only personal petitions, but they also include petitions for the community? What do you mean by online prayers and please describe the parameters uh, set in your research? They're asking about the the online prayers, which, you know, according to the, the one who raised the question, uh, appear to be not only, at, I don't know if this part of the claim, but it's in the conclusion, according to the question, are not only, uh, uh, online prayers are not only personal petitions, but they also include petitions for the community. Yeah, so, of course, uh, it can concern the community, but, uh, our concern now is to find patterns whether this go beyond family matters. I say what our our concern is to debunk the idea that women Catholics are generally uh, socialized in traditional gender role. Therefore, most studies point to the concern of family matters, no, of most of women. But surprisingly, the prayers we we do it. Uh, scrutinize the prayers carefully and we find the patterns no and it, it we found out that it's more than the family in fact more than two thirds of the prayers focus on the community no the frontliners the country and the global community so you see the 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 point there but again the the solidarity this type of solidarity is more of disaster solidarity, it is more the transient rather than the virtue uh, or faith-driven solidarity taught by the Catholic, by Catholic social teaching. So yan ang nakikita namin, no? Na lumalabas na merong social awareness beyond the family, no? Hindi lang caregivers uh, concerned for the health of the family, pero meron ding compassion labas sa pamilya. At yun ay mas higit pa. Kaya lang, yung pangunawa namin ay ito ay uh, karaniwang naranasan ng mga tao under disaster, during disasters na sa tingin namin ay hindi siya more on faith-driven. Kaya nga ang aming recommendation is incorporate uh, catechism. We know that it's the best secret, best kept secret and Catholic social teaching. In fact, most of my publications are trying to incorporate Catholic social teaching with the social sciences. That's what we lack in the Catholic Church. No? So I hope I was able to answer it. No? The teaching to the community, but you will look, analyze the pattern of these, uh, these courses. No? Now, sa tingin namin ay malawak pa sa pamilya. Thank you, Dr. Baliano. Um, we have another question for Dr. Aziz. 
Uh, we appreciate your study on the historical uh, Jesus that is relevant to Filipino Christology. Jesus in the Calvary is akin to the marginalized Filipinos. Question is, why does your study dwell more on the suffering Christ and not the resurrected Christ? Again, why does your study dwell more on the suffering Christ and not on the resurrected Christ? Uh, okay, sorry, stop. sorry, Dr. Asis, may follow-up pala yun para hindi hanging. Ang, ang follow-up question on, is it right to say that by dwelling more to the suffering Christ, you dwell to the Filipino masochism or the pleasure of pain principle? Is it right to say that by dwelling more to the suffering Christ, you also dwell to the Filipino masochism or the pleasure in pain principle? Dr. Okay, yung unang tanong. Ano yung unang tanong? Nakalimutan ko na. <laughs> Ang question niya po, why, why is your study daw more on the suffering Christ rather than the resurrected Christ? And uh, because follow we have... up on that is that tama po raw bang sabihin na, you know, that by dwelling more on the suffering Christ, which is the concept of your study, um, it, it seems like the Filipinos also love this idea of, of you know, the concept of masochism like okay, anyway. the pleasure okay, anyway. principle. Okay, una, kasi yung suffering Christ, yun yung topic natin. Eh, for the na topic natin for the conference, di ba? Yung suffering, di ba? Yung black Nazarene, suffering black Nazarene. And second, I, th I think because uh, it's uh, because it's more concrete eh, yung suffering. Uh, I haven't encountered the risen Christ. I haven't seen him, di ba? Of course, our faith tells us he is there. But we have records of his suffering. Of course, there are records of the risen Christ. But <clears throat> any human being has uh, any human being has a more concrete experience of suffering. So that's why uh, the Christology it's a Christology of suffering because, well, again, for the most part, for Filipinos, diba, it is a suffering God that makes sense to them. For some reason, it should be the reason Christ, but it is not. It is not, for some reason, it does not grab us. Eh. Diba? As human beings, as Filipinos, as Christians, the reason Christ. Diba? Unless you are, a, I don't know, a born again Christian or a Pentecostal who, you know, who in their worship, they really acknowledge the reason Christ. But because it is suffering that is the experience of human beings. In fact, uh, as I speak, diba? Mi millions are suffering in Europe now, in Ukraine, and there is the threat of a nuclear war. Okay, uh, today, no, I couldn't imagine that within my lifetime there will be another threat of a nuclear war. I was a, a kid in the seventies, now when there was the threat of the nuclear war during the cold. But anyway, suffering kasi is concrete. Yung masokisim naman. <clears throat> Ah, uh, hindi. Uh, well, when, when, no, no, no. Uh, I, I hate to call it masochism on the part of the devotees, the Black Nazareth. It's not. I think it is simply sentimentalism. They become emotional when they talk about the suffering. They, they reflect on the wound on the first hand, on the left hand, on the right hand. So, major OA, but it's not masochistic. Okay, I think it is simply an attempt to make sense of their own personal suffering. Nagihirap ako, wala akong makain, wala akong trabaho, inaapi kami, squatter kami, and so on. So, so they find comfort no, in, the, in the looking at the Black Nazarene because for them that is a God who is with us, who is in solidarity with us. So, so I hate to call it masochistic on the part of of the devotees. Hindi naman, I don't think, I don't think it's an exercise in masochism. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Aziz. Uh, we have a question here for Father J.M. Manzano, SJ. Uh, how does popular religiosity, like the devotion to the Black Nazarene, uh, help us towards what Juan Baltazar called return to center? I repeat, how does popular religiosity, like the devotion to the Black Nazarene help us towards what Juan Baltazar called return to center.
Uh, sorry, Father, uh, audio po. All right. So, um, I myself am a product of popular devotions. No, I am a priest now because of the popular devotions and specifically with what I've shared. No, and that is why in my ministry now of evangelizing, it makes uh, my ministry of evangelization more alive, uh, more, uh, you know, uh, closer to uh, what the Lord has uh, uh, preached, you know, uh, to the good news. You know? And it's not something about the, the intellect only. You know? And it's some, not something about psychology or the, the many other fields, not about theology, but it's something that it's, you know, it, it's hard to explain. <laughs> yeah, and that's why it, it's through seeing and touching, you know, and it's yeah deeply personal no? uh, so so that's 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 where that's why uh, you know uh, what what I, I wrote about is something that that could even be deepened in various ways thank you uh, father and then here's a question for dr calano how did lino broca's film bona reconcile the sacred and the secular aspects of the devotion to Black Nazarene. How did Lino Broca's film Bona reconcile the sacred and the secular aspects of the devotion to Black Nazarene? By initiating the film and juxtaposing, by initiating the film with the devotion and then shifting eventually to fandom, I think Lino Broca is telling us that fandom and devotion follow similar movements. And uh, the movements of... Uh, excess the movements of ex of of that is demonstrated by bona in his devotion to gardo uh, somehow in one way or another reflects also most probably uh, her devotion to the black nazarene in that sense uh, how we are devoted to others or how we we treat the people that we consider to be fans, uh, that, that we consider to be idols, uh, will also necessarily reflect uh, our devotion, no? our prayer life. And uh, in, uh, just like uh, Father John was saying, there's no distinctions of fields or disciplines. So, are, so is there no distinction between the secular and the sacred, especially in that film. No? And that's the reason why I think that to simply compartmentalize her treatment of Gardo, uh, is to really misunderstand uh, the juxtaposition that took place in the beginning of that film. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, sir Bong, you have a question here. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we can't spare our own no, no, live speaker here. Just one question naman po. Bagaman nananatiling, nananatiling pangangailangan ang pagpapanatiling ng siguridad sa simbahan ng Quiapo, kinakailangan din bigyang pansin ng isa pang malalim na usaping naghahati sa atin. Ito ay ang politikal na hidwaan na dala ng pangangalat ng maling informasyon at pagbabaluktot ng kasaysayan. So yeah, no, history and fake news, yeah, I suppose. No? Uh, na buong naniniwala tayo ay may mga kabalyero ng puon at ng itinuturo niyang katotohanan. Ano po kaya ang papel na gagampanan? Mahalagang papel na gagampanan ng simbahan at komunidad ng Kiyapo, lalo na sa darating na halalan in 50 past days sa, at pagpapalitan din ng administrasyon. Napakagandang tanong. <laughs> Complex question. Maraming salamat po sa nakakaantig na katanong, katanungan. Nakarang, yan ang katotohanan ng panahon ngayon. Minimithi po ng kahit na sinong uh, pinuno ng simbahan na ang kanyang kawan ay maging mulat, gising, at uh, tumatahak sa landas ng katotohanan at katotohanan lamang. Ang problema, paano, yung paano kung ang pinaniniwalaan niya o nagutunan niya alam, inakala niya ang totoo ay mali. Dito pumapasok yung yung uh, sa aral ng simbahan, tatawagin natin itong magisterium, ano? Yung uh, 
yung tanggapan ng simbahan na siyang nagtuturo ng uh, mga aral ng doktrina na sabi nga ni Father Earl kanina, hindi na babago ang doktrina pero yung konteksto ang dynamic na laging nagbabago. At alalahanin po natin na ang simbahan ay hindi lamang yung mga kaparian kundi ang pare at ang laiko. At yung pagharap natin sa katotohanan ay interaction ng dalawang grupong ito at yung interaction mismo ng simbahan bilang isang sektor sa lipunan. Hindi natin kailangan mag-away sapagkat kailangan natin ang bawat isa sa paghahanap ng katotohanan. At yung paghahanap, binanggit na makailang beses, laging pang contextual. Kasi yung hinahanap natin, mukha ng katotohanan ngayon, ay maaaring hindi yung mukha na hinahanap ng mga elders natin noon. Kaya ito ay tuwi na napapanahon at um, <clears throat> how do we say that? Culturally situated. Ako? Ayan. Huwag lamang po sana tayong magsawa. Huwag sana tayong magsawang maghanap ng totoo at tama. Maging pasensyoso tayo sa bawat isa. At kapit kamay tayo, walang itutulak, walang iiwanan. Kapit kamay tayo maghanap ng totoo at ng tama. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Sir Bong. Very inspiring, no? Uh, Napapapalakpak dito si Father Earl. Um, may isa tayo ng comment na basahin ko from Mr. Josdado Franco. And this actually a um, comment for him. Actually, it's just a statement that he highlighted uh, that was authored by Dr. Aces mentioned Filipino devotees most probably can relate more to suffering compared to recent experience. Ah, uh, how we wish, no? We have longer time to have this kind of intellectual, religious, academic, personal discourse. Napakalalim ng mga diskurso sa dalawang maikling araw, ngunit tunay namang makabuluhan, uh, pagpapalitan ng ideya, pag-aaral, komentaryo, ng lahat na nakibahagi sa dalawang araw na following. We will now award the certificates of recognition to our distinguished paper presenters. Citation reads, the minor basilica of the Black Nazarene, Capo Manila, awards this certificate of recognition first to Dr. Michael Demetrius H. Assis for delivering their, uh, his paper and ty, uh, sorry, delivering his paper at the first National Research Forum on the Black Nazarene with the theme, 500 Years of Journey with the Black Nazarene, Devotion and Discourse held on March 16 to 17, 2022 via Zoom virtual conferencing, signed Reverend Monsignor Hernando Coronel, PhD, lead convener. What is paper entitled The Difficulties and Challenges of Our Devotion to the Suffering Christ in the Black Nazarene? Thank you very much, um, Dr. Aziz. Uh, Thank you. Same citation follows. Uh, certificate of recognition is awarded to the next paper presenter. Dr. Vivencio Baliano and together with him, um, Dean Raul Roland Sebastian for presenting their papers entitled Gender, Catholic Social Teaching and COVID-19 in the Philippines. Analyzing the social solidarity of women devotees. Ayan. Oh, uh, okay, sorry. Analyzing the social solidarity of women devotees into Black Nazarene Facebook groups. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Valiano and Dean Sebastian. The next certificate uh, for Father Jose Marie J.M. D. Manzano, S.J., for his paper presentation entitled uh, The Way of Contemplation, The Greatest is Love. Thank you, Father J.M. Next, the same uh, certificate citation is awarded to Mr. John Bonnet Jordan uh, for presenting his paper titled
Poderoso, Power, Praise, and Performance of Popular Devotion to the Black Nazarene. Thank you very much, Mr. Jordan. And finally, Certificate of Recognition is also awarded to Mr. Christopher P. Graho. Ah, okay. Um, because I said finally, you know. Oh, nga pala. Mr. Graho, second to the last, for, our, uh, for presenting his paper entitled Calvary to Calvary, Continuing Persecution of the Nazarene. Thank you. And of course, we have Father Mark Joseph Colano for uh, Doctor, sorry, Dr. Mark Joseph Colano for his paper entitled Juxtaposing Devotion in Cinemas, The Devotion to the Black Nazarene and Lino Broca's film, Bona. So ito, picture to follow. Very, very interesting study, sir. Very promising study, doctor. And that concludes our two-day forum of very rich discourse and research discussion on interdisciplinary topics that center on the Black Nazarene. These studies are leading sources of our Christian culture and values as we continue to investigate, study, analyze, understand religion as one of the most basic components of human society and culture. Now, the big question is, what's next after the, this first National Research Forum? To give us a glimpse of what awaits us after the success of today's event, here's a man whom I will tell you initially conceived this forum years ago, and of course, with the help and full support of Father Dean Coronel and the minor Basilica of the Black Nazarene Peace and staff, and all of you as well watching us here today, including our resource speakers, paper presenters, the forum conveners, the event hosts, technical staff, you know, you all have contributed to the success of this student event. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, here is um, Sir Bong Graho. Thank you, Prof. Ivy. Without much ado. Yesterday, at the opening of the conference, participants and social media viewers were greeting and congratulating one another for this historic event. I was told this is the first research forum outside theological schools and seminaries. The idea was first planted by Monsignor Clemente Ignacio, who invited Professor Shao Chua to document the conduct of the Black Nazarene Translation, who in his own words said, that would help us analyze and improve our systems and processes. The idea was nurtured by the current parish priest, Monsignor Hernando Coronel, as he patiently attends every single meeting in the preparations and patiently tell the stories to researchers who come to Quiapo or contact Quiapo, the likes of Dr. Stagliara and the Spiritu who were writing from overseas and the USD professors who first started an also ethnographic, ethnographic and popular religiosity research among the devotees Two years before the pandemic. They are Drs. Perenia, Orteola, Graho, Ampil, and Professor Nogot. Thus, the seeming confluence of events and intersection of interests gave birth to the idea of having a forum to help not only researchers, but to help devotees and enlighten the non-believers too on the profound value of devotion in one's life. Theology, we say, is fides querens intellectum, faith seeking understanding. As in any other human experience, understanding the devotion to the Black Nazarene is highly contextualized to one's cultural and time settings, aided by symbols and linguistics. What consoles our elderly devotees may not be interesting to the younger ones. The current generation who is highly analytical, pragmatic, 
and so immersed in metaverse, needs to rediscover the experience for themselves, the sacred and the secular dimensions of the devotion. This highly inquisitive generation might be aptly called intellectum querens fidem, knowledge seeking faith. Let us not forget our pillars, Father Catalino Arevalo, Cardinal Tagle, who invited us, theologians from the classroom, to learn from the theologians on the streets, on the pews, if I may, to help the youth and to help one another. Elders who happen to have been gifted with eloquence in speaking and writing has the obligation to continue presenting and listening to each other's discourse, documenting, publishing, and building a knowledge base, beginning with the insights we learned in this conference, will not only guide our faithful, but it could also enlighten those searching for meaning. Towards this end, please expect that this will only be the beginning. An annual forum will be conducted, and the mini fora in between is already a welcome suggestion. We look, we look forward to the participation of researchers from Visayas and Mindanao who have greater affinity to the young Jesus Christ, the Santo Nino, and from North Luzon who are more fond with the Holy Mother of the Nazarene. If I may float the question this early, it would be, how do you see the devotees to the Black Nazarene from your own situation in life? Together, let us seek God's blessings and mercy to know Him more clearly, follow Him more nearly, and love Him more dearly. Maraming salamat po. So part no, of this seminar, by the way, uh, guidelines will be sent for the publication of the commemorative book on this first National Research Forum on the Black Nazarene. Thank you, Sir Pong, and to those of the entire community and Father Dean Coronel and Father Earl here and the minor basilica of the Black Nazarene priest and staff, and of course, with deep prayer, truly, if it is God's, if it is for God's greatest glory, nothing is possible. Nothing is impossible. Domino Apostol, we say, Lord, the word is to yours. We shall now end our event with the final blessing from our lead convener, is Most Reverend Monsignor Orlando Dean Coronel, Rector and Parish Priest of the Minor Basilica of the Black Nazarene. Maraming salamat, uh, Professora Ivy. Uh, bago ko ibibigay ang huling pagbabasbas, ako po ay nagpapasalamat sa lahat sa inyo. Itong dalawang araw na ito ay mga araw ng pagpapala. At gaya nga ng sinabi ko sa simula ay ito'y isang pamamaraan upang mapalapit, makilala natin ang ating po gusto sa sareno, ang kanyang pagbibigay ng sarili ay ating pinapasalamatan, lalong lalo ngayon ay panahon ng kwaresma. Tumatanaw ng utang na loob po kami sa lahat ng mga organizers, participants, moderators, speakers, presenters, listeners, and partners. Hindi ko na po may isa-isa yung mga pangalan po ninyo. Napakadami po pero pagkatapos na may mga credits po tayo at kikilalari natin ang kanilang mga malaking contribution. Muli nagpapasalamat tayo sa ating po Mr. Nazareno sa kanyang kabaitan. At ibibigay ko na po ang aking pagbabasbas. Sumayin niyo ang Panginoon at pagpalain kayo ng makapangirihan Diyos, Ama, Anak, at Spiritus Santo. Amen. Kumayo lagi tayo sa kapayapaan at pag-ibig ng ating Pong Jesus na Sareno. Salamat sa Diyos. Viva Pong Jesus na Sareno. Viva! Would like to announce our participants to please turn on your videos.
we shall have our online group picture thing. This is a new thing. Eh. Ito na ang new normal. No? Uh, we are requesting whether you can stay there anyway in the center. And then the rest of the, uh, the, the members of the committee, Ma, yan, kasama po tayo. May we request our participants? We are making history the first national research forum on the Black Nazarene. So please, requesting everyone to turn on your videos just for a short minute. And let us have our souvenir picture taking. Smile, everyone. I have to count daw po. Kita na ba lahat ng view? Oh, okay. Uh, so that the, uh, the viewers can also hear. Sige po. Ready? One, two, three. Now, just keep on smiling kasi po hati tayo dahil marami tayo. May page to daw ito. Again, one, two, three. Thank you very much, everyone. God bless. And please enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank <laughs> you. 